There we go. <laughs> Every time it's a surprise. Welcome once again to another episode, session, congregation. Another congregation of the Legends of the Drowned Isles. A homebrew D&D 5th Ed campaign uh, called The Great Confusion. I'm the host, GM, and general bottle washer. I'm Mark the Encaffeinated One. And I'm very happy to be joined by my players starting on my left with Silas. Hi, my name is Pat. I'm playing Silas Marsh, uh, local warlock and bard, bard lock. Hi, I, I'm Maggie, and I am playing Annie, who is our very elegant rogue. Hey, I'm Nax, and I'm playing Medrek, half orc cleric. Elegant I almost rogue. accidentally muted myself. No, that's no worries. <laughs> uh, elegant rogue feels like it should be elegant rouge. Like the misspelling should be <laughs> there somehow. Oh, God. <laughs> well, I mean, I am dyslexic, so I have done that. Or if you're a rogue, you're slick dexic. That's probably a terrible joke. <laughs> Most of my jokes are terrible. Welcome back to the world of Amisha, a, a uh, world in the midst of uh, transformation, coming out of a cloud or possibly going into one. The great confusion has spread across the land, and it is causing some concern. Things don't seem like they line up. The universe isn't quite right. These folks have some inkling about what might have happened. The removal of a god from the universe creates certain uncertainties. It makes um, some things very uneven for a while. Not only that but this particular place that they find themselves, the town of Elthvater on the western edge of Eskus, is, it seems, not quite this sleepy little fishing town it might at first appear. Instead, it seems as though large forces are interested in this place for some particular reason. Well, those are all pushed aside for a moment for an elegant party hosted by the Baron and Baroness. The Harquins had themselves been somewhat displaced in recent months, but the miraculous recovery of the Baroness from her terrible illness and the seeming complete return of the Baron's full faculties seems to be a, a cause for celebration. They brought to town a circus, the Circus Maximus, led by one rather, uh, uh, I want to say, uh, outrageous Dragonborn, uh, Maxis Fenken Cabardon, I believe, who is uh, currently one of the attendees of this finale party at the very end, in which many of the luminaries of town, which seems strange again given a small fishing village, but they seem to come out of the woodwork when a party's involved. And also coming out of the woodwork are the three of you. Medric, well known as the Phoenix Champion, a celebrated, celebrated hero of, uh, of fire and light, taking up the mantle after the former, uh, the former, uh, not Lamplighter, what was her title? Flamekeeper. Pardon? Flamekeeper Tidewell. Flamekeeper, thank you very much. I wrote all this stuff, it doesn't mean I get to remember it. Uh, after the former <laughs> Flamekeeper unfortunately was felled during one of the, the many attacks on this town, but a celebrated hero nonetheless, recognizable by all and attending this this fantastic costume slash masked ball as the Phoenix Champion. Okay, maybe not the most original of costumes, but certainly one that turns heads, especially when beside uh, Melora, who decided that you were coming with her. Also at this party, playing a lower key role, at least at the party, is, well, just known as Annie. She's a... A person who came from outside of town and kind of found herself uh, involved in the local constabulary in more ways than one, uh, but has a, a mysterious past, a royal past that she doesn't let most people know. But a few people do. The two of you both uh, know, of course, of her history and her uh, decision to run away from home for a while to see how the world really is. And, of course, one of the other people that knows is the date that you have for this evening, Captain Olian Verendel, an elf himself of some noble background, um, but also happens to serve as the town's reeve. 
and both of you are attending this costume ball. Um, Olin uh, has a um, maybe an ostentatious mask with a unicorn horn on his forehead. And uh, Annie, uh, describe your costume once more. So it's a purple gown um, with my hair cascading all to one side and pinned to one side. Um, and I have a mask that is very um, butterfly-like. Uh, it has like, it's kind of more plain on one side and then it has like a big butterfly wing on, on the other. And what color is Annie's hair? Uh, very blonde, like a, a blonde that people don't usually see. So the random picture that showed up on my desktop, which is hilarious, I can see it just around the edge of this, is a field of purple flowers with little yellow buds inside and the occasional uh, butterfly landing on them. So that's now my, my mental mnemonic to remember uh, Annie's uh, elaborate costume. Uh, and also attending, sort of attending the party, sort of crashing the party, is our third PC, Silas Marsh of the Marshes, a small town just on the edge of uh, civilization. And Silas, you decided you wanted to go, but you wanted to go on your own terms and managed to sneak in through the second floor uh, and ran into Sable Harquin, who you know both as the oldest daughter of the Baron and Baroness, and somehow aligned with the Diamond, a infamous local uh, criminal figure who seems to have a very strong feeling towards the Baron in particular. Now, at this party, various things have been happening. Um, there was a big dance. That was pretty important. Uh, there also was a strange break-in, which Silas ran across, in which they ran into Jordy, who seems to be tied up with the diamond in one way or another. Jordy the dwarf you met out at the Rabbit Hollow Camp, I believe, as one of the uh, woodworkers out there. Um, the other more bizarre thing that you've discovered here are these strange little bags that were attached to certain places, certain hard to see places. You wouldn't notice them unless you happen to look underneath tables or behind things. But as they were approached, they seemed to explode, providing a burst of strange greenish particles into the air, which uh, uh, overwhelms whoever happens to be nearby. So far, I believe you've found three of them. There was one in the dining room Four of them, actually. There's one in the dining room. There was one in the... Was there one in the kitchen? One in the washroom. One in the washroom, that was it. Yeah, uh, the dining room, the washroom. kitchen, the washroom. Yeah. There you go. Oh, actually, and there was the one in one, the... There was one in the, in the uh, room outside of the uh, study and outside of the uh, Baron study. Let's see what room. Library, yes. Yeah. That was the third one, wasn't it? Maybe that was the third. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's the ballroom, the bathroom, and the side room. Uh, well, the dining room, not the ballroom. I had a bird yeah. flew out of the uh, sitting room. I forget what that means, but well, apparently as you the were, sitting room was really gross. As you were looking around at different places, you happened to run into the solar, which is a room full of big glass windows. In there, you happen to seemingly stumble upon someone who was looking around, a strange shadow-like figure who vanished through the windows, and in that room happened to also stumble upon an old stoppered vase, uh, which seemed to have Athlonian writing on it. In the sitting room, when you poked your head in, you saw that it looked like the big tufted uh, green carpet on the floor may not have been carpet at all, but may have been some sort of frond. And from that room, a uh, black uh, uh, raven flew out by you, which you quickly decided the better part of valor was to close the door and quickly move away. But as you've been investigating, you have found yourselves in the dining room. I'm going to switch over to the map view just to make it a little easier here. You found yourself in the dining room, and with the uncanny senses that Annie has, she's been noticing there's been something or other 
invisible, moving around in the building. It seems to have found it nearby here, and fortuitously, at the same time when Silas was poking around and exploding a uh, one of the other parcels, uh, Silas contacted Annie, who said, Come over. I think we've got it cornered. And that's where we find ourselves right now. Uh, Medrick, Verendel, Annie, and Silas are all in the dining room, and you believe that something is also in there with you. Now, uh, I'll have you each roll initiative just to kind of keep an order going. Uh, it makes it a little bit easier, I think, for everyone involved. All right, select my icon. And then, fuck, how did this go again? Right. Now, if you have nothing in particular to do on your turn when it's called, you can simply pass. There's nothing really that timely here. It's mostly to make sure that everybody has some idea of when they're going to be uh, going. Let's see if this works. Can you add me to the initiative? I certainly can. With a 26. Oh, nice. 26. Well, this is a this is a feature. Oops, I didn't mean to cross you out. That was not what I wanted to click. Um, there we go. Suddenly I die. Just collapse. Well, you know, it's bound Pile to happen eventually. <laughs> Pile of tool. <laughs> oh. The menu is too small to fit on my screen here. There we go. You should be able to change that. And okay. All right. And what did Silas get? Eighteen point two five or point yep. twelve? All right. That's not the right button. Oh, I had something else selected that changed my mind. Pardon me. All the technical things. All right. So, this was your idea, Annie. You've assembled everybody. And now they're all kind of looking to you to take the lead. Uh, Silas has something he's going to do as soon as he enters, but uh, he can wait for Annie. So, if I recall correctly, um, I have 10 feet of distance, so I felt him, like, leave my, uh, he was going, like, give me two seconds here. Medrick is just going to stand he, he in the He was going doorway. this way, correct? Um, something like that. When you entered the, the door, it was within range of you, and then it seemed to move away outside of your range. Um, so outside of the 10-foot range around you, essentially, right now is... Where you believe it to be. Okay. Um, I am going to then um let's see. I'm gonna go to here. Um and I'm gonna stand behind that uh that chair and um, can I feel where they are now? Uh, you can make a perception check. Okay. 
Natural 16. Uh, 17. 17. You walk around the table kind of trying to... to fee- how, does, how does blind sense work for Manny? Is it a mystical thing or is it just a... Is it a sense of kind of the, the air moving? What's the, the, the sensation for Annie? I feel like it would be, you know, that feeling of like, feeling like someone's watching you, but okay. more precise. Okay. As you move into that area, you're kind of trying to reach out. And while there's a vague notion that you're being watched, you can't pinpoint it. Either they're hiding, or maybe they've moved out of the way, or or what? You're not quite sure. So you aren't able to pinpoint anything nearby. But you have a vague sense that something still might be around. Okay. I'm going to pick up a pastry from the table, um, and that uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to If I feel them, I'm going to try to trip in that general direction and drop the cake. Okay. So it's kind of a a held action waiting for that perception to kick in. Okay. What's your passive perception? Not great. Uh, 11. Okay. So Annie's kind of moved into position. You see her pick up a pastry. But it wouldn't be affected by him not not being seen by me because of the blind sight. Right, right. Uh, okay. Um, Verandel's kind of looking to you and then kind of trying to figure out what to do. Um, probably going to... Well, actually, he looks to you for instruction. Do you give him any uh, any hint as to what to do? I don't really want to say anything out loud because the thing doesn't know that I know that they're there. Okay. So. All right. Um, So Varendel kind of looks between all of you and kind of moves over to the other end of the table. And you can see him kind of trying to look like he's stretching. But really what he's doing is he's putting his arms out to make sure that if anything comes near him, he'll he'll, uh, detect it. So let's see how... How subtle or not he might be. Uh, Let's see. Yeah. Just a subtle stretch. It's just a... I'm going to call that a sleight of hand. Uh, Yeah, it's pretty pretty convincing. Pretty convincing. He'd probably get away with it in a movie theater. And he just kind of casually stretches out as if, you know, it's been a long party. It's kind of rolling the shoulders. Uh, But his eyes are moving enough uh, to, to indicate that he's watching around. How about you, Silas? You've come into the room now, and you see them kind of approaching. What do you want to do? Uh, he uh, comes running in and lets loose a fairy fire. Ah, nice. On that area. Okay. Uh, is that a dex save? Yes, it's a dex save for everybody who's there. Yeah, so Varendel and Annie also make that dex save. Let's see. It's all good. I'm good at those. And I don't think there's anything. Difficulty is 15. 15. Okay. Uh, Let's see. I don't know if you're seeing my rolls at all. I tried to. I'm seeing the rolls, but not the person. Okay. Let's see. Where are you, Brandel, for a deck save? What's the, the, the target? 15. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. 16 for me. Nice. So the two of you kind of uh, describe how Annie kind of uh, avoids the fairy fire. What is she doing? Because this is a very obvious thing, and it's kind of exploding into the area. How do you avoid the purple dust? I drop my cake and pick it up. <laughs> okay. Oh right. no. <laughs> uh, let's see. I'm going to use. Uh, 
Let's see here. An abstract icon. So as the fairy fire settles down, uh, actually, I don't need that. Never mind. Uh, it will reveal a shape to what you find there. Um, it's not that size. I can't really resize the icons that well. But um, laying upon the corner of the table, you see the, the fairy fire kind of settle in. And almost as though the little bits of purple light and fluff are attracted to a body, um, attracted to a living being as opposed to the furniture, which is sort of semi-outlines and then is not interested in. You see it lay upon this uh, coiled, uh, semi-coiled uh, centipede, which is on the corner of the table. It seems to react uh, by kind of popping its little head up and looking around in somewhat surprise. Nedrick. So do we see the centipede or do we see like an outline of it in the fairy fire? You see an outline of it. Yeah. It, it, it disables the effect in terms of advantage or disadvantage from the invisibility, but you don't really see the creature. But the outline is sufficiently detailed. You can make out the shape of a centipede. It's only about, uh, it's about a foot long, probably if it was all stretched out. Also, if you want to whack it, you get advantage. All right. I think it, I think it just evens out the advantage or disadvantage from, from my invisibility, doesn't it? Well, it nullifies invisibility, and every anybody who's oh. affected by it, people have advantage to hit them. Perfect. There you go. All right. I'll step in, shut the door behind me so it can't escape. Okay. And what kind of like uh, potentially damaging objects do I see around me? Um, there are, you know, plates and knives and forks on the table for people. There's, uh, mugs and glasses. You can see on the far side of the room, uh, there are, um, some fancy looking bottles. They haven't been opened, but, uh, you do see them over there. Um, All right. whatever else you might imagine you would see in a, in a fairly sparsely, uh, furnished dining room. Uh, you have a feeling that maybe any of the really expensive stuff has been put away. So I'll grab the nearest knife I can find and attack the centipede with it. Okay. So you grab a butter knife. So I could try to restrain it. To, I don't know if it's toxic or poisonous or not, or venomous, whatever. And like half a centipede works just as good as evidence as a whole centipede. Okay. You can certainly try. All right. As, as, uh, as you go full commando on the centipede. Where's my sheet? Crap. I'm so not used to roll 20 anymore. Oh my god. <laughs> Attack roll. Where is it? Right, proficiency bonus plus strength. Okay. Non natural 20. No, that's enough. Absolutely. So we'll treat this as a as a minor dagger. It's a D2 plus strength. Okay. It's a, it's a butter knife. It's not really sharpened. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little bit better than this than a, you know a slap from a hand. It's a it's a G two. Basically, alike enough for it not to be defaulted as a an improvised weapon. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. I'm pretty okay, sure. So there's no D two in roll twenty, so I'll just roll a D four and sure half that, that I guess. So round up, round down, like one that'd or two plus one. three. That'd be yeah. a one, so total of four? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, the butter knife comes uh, clanging down on it, and it seems to squirm just a little bit. The, the, the edge of the butter knife cuts into it a little bit, and it sort of squirms away from it. It's not dead, but it's definitely wounded. A little yeah. bit of, of green ooze comes out of the side of it. Do I have another, like, can I, could I try to, to grab it as a bonus action? Um, not unless you have a bonus action, which gives you a grab. I don't think I do. Oh, well. Somebody grab it. Or kill it, and then grab it. Okay, you stabbed at the thing. It squirms. Uh, back around to Annie. 
you you froze there for me oh you're back okay yeah, uh, i am here. going to um hmm. actually you don't see it cut you see a little ooze of green on the on the table and the ooze okay. almost vanishes immediately i am going to I want to grab a cup okay. um, uh, and try to catch it that way. It oh, is about that, a that, that's smart. foot long. Uh, oh. Grab yeah. a bowl. A bowl could work. Mm. You, could, you could dump out a bowl of, of uh, popcorn. Nah, I'll just grab my dagger. A real dagger this time, not a butter knife. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that's cocked. Ooh, that's a natural 20. Hey, you. Oh, that's a hit. With vice. Which is... Shink. I need vice's sheet there. Uh, okay. So that is... Two plus four. So six normal damage. And then three... Um, Force damage. Okay, from from uh, I forget where you're keeping. Uh, and you vice, and you critted, but... didn't you? Oh yes. Oh yeah. So add three to the normal damage and one to the force damage. Okay, where are you uh, keeping uh, uh, the 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 knife or the dagger? By the way, on my leg. Okay, so kind of I don't know if you're still trying to maintain the ruse with the cupcake at all, but. Uh, Oh, no, the cupcake is on the ground. <laughs> Within a, a flash of a second, uh, Vice is out and <laughs> stabbed down through the thing easily uh, and into the table. You feel the, the, the meat or the, the, the edge of Vice sink into this kind of fancy uh, dining room table straight on through the thing. Um, narrowly, you know, almost cutting it entirely in two. Uh, with the angle of the blade. And then within a second or so, you feel the thing stop squirming and then start to shift in shape and shifts uh, larger, actually, um, and seems to stretch out and limbs start to stretch out of the two sides of its of its uh, a body, uh, two, si two limbs on each side, stretches into a vaguely humanoid shape within a, a flash of an instant, uh, but it's it's green and sort of reptilian scales with a with an underbody that's slightly lighter, a hideous face like a squished in rat's face. Large ears start to appear on its sides, little little horns start to form forward on its on its head, and it kind of squirms, not able to remove itself from the dagger, uh, and then you hear it kind of gasp. And may I remember how to rogue? You certainly can. Uh, you want to there roll was your, your, uh, your sneak, sneak attack your because sneak magic attack is there. I mean, so that's another 8d6. Uh, <laughs> uh, six, seven, eight. Dad first, ask questions later. 18, 26. Okay. 26. 26. For the sneak attack. Well, it had five. Um, as it. I'm, I mean, if, if it's similar to like polymorph or anything like that the damage still carries over um similar as a way to put it uh as the the creature writhes and kind of gives this last gasp of of air at the very end of the gasp in this hideous creature's uh, uh mouth is the sort of <coughs> <coughs> and it breathes no more and grows still and begins to melt Within a second or so, its form has dissolved and vanished, leaving nothing behind except for the kind of large cut in the corner of the table where the very, very strong strike uh, embedded vice into the table for a second. Where did it go? I'm going to wipe. I'm going to wipe vice down with a napkin and put it back. There's not even any residue on the blade. The entirety of the thing is gone. What was that? 
That was my Silas question. recognize what it was? Um, what, if you have an appropriate skill you want to roll for recognition? I don't know if you've seen anything like that directly before. Uh, but if you have... I don't know. What, what, good. Do you have... Uh, Kena, um, non-skilled in nature. They don't really have monster recognition skills these days. But. Yeah. Um, I will say go ahead and give me an Arcana check. 11. Okay. Based on the way that it, it that it sort of dissolved and vanished, um, it's easy to conclude that it was a non-corporeal being. It was some fey creature or some otherworldly creature that's not composed of matter from this world. And thus, when dispatched, its link was broken and it vanished. Mm. Possibly not dead, depending on what kind of oh. creature it is. Yeah. How big did it get in its non centipede form? Uh, about the size of a gnome, almost two feet long. So it, it, it was okay. vastly bigger than that small form. And very hideous. Very sort of animal-like, but it had this weird sheen of intelligence to it. Do I recognize it at all? Like, I mean, like for can, example, would uh, the scriptures of Ignis have mentioned anything about such a creature or things I mean, that you can make a religion <laughs> check if you want to take it from that angle? That's what I'm doing. <laughs> Twenty. Your role wasn't with advantage, was it, uh, uh, Pat? You just happened to roll both. Oh, I only got an 11. Okay. And a dirty... It's already... It's a, Sorry? I just, it's always set to roll both. Okay. And a dirty 20 for, um, for Medric. Yeah. As you think back to some of the training you had and all of the different... All of the different enemies of Ignis, uh, I suspect that Ignis is very much on... These are the things you kill. Uh, these are the <laughs> things you might save, and these are the things you must defend uh, with, you know, the informal rule among many, especially the 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 Kamar, although you don't know of too many other Kamar, is burn it with fire. Uh, in this particular case, uh, it is definitely uh, a, a, a creature, uh, not only not of this world, but one which does not belong in this world. Um, some kind of demonic creature. Um, the, the, the particular size of it suggests that it's one of the demonic familiars, not an actual demon. It is not something which, uh, it is, uh, uh, um, anywhere in the demonic ranks and has very little power, but you're pretty sure that you identify this one called a quasit. And they are, they, they... They kind of have that, that reputation of being pests more than anything else, unless they are familiars, which means they're working for somebody else. For somebody else who's probably here and trying to mess with the party. And they aren't super intelligent, but they can carry out commands and things like that. Okay. I'll explain to uh, everybody in the room that it's a closet, and there's a chance it's a familiar, which means something else in this mansion is controlling it or was controlling it or... Mm. It reports to them anyway. And or someone probably else. knows that we're poking around. Yeah. yeah it's not of this world, be. and there, if there's one thing that's not of this world, and it, I'm assuming uh, the way it melted and left no trace was similar to the little like uh, bags under the tables. Yes, although they did leave a trace briefly. This one didn't have any sort of afterglow. Okay. So we're probably dealing with something demonic. Yeah, and, uh, I, I don't know if we should teaching. inform the Baron of this. Silas is going to drop to his hands and knees and check under the table to make sure there's not another one hiding there, glowing purple. Okay. Um, Varendel kind of looks at you, Medric. I'm going to have to report this at some point, but I want to have a little bit more information before I do. Uh, it is yeah, same. an obligation. I'm not, I, I, yeah, I'm not saying not report it. I'm just saying uh, if the Baron or the Baroness are responsible for this. We don't want to let them know that we know. <laughs> well, didn't you just say they probably already knew or whoever did control this probably already knows? 
Um, take a make a perception check, uh, Silas, as you kind of poke under the table. Nothing immediately stands out to you, but if you're taking a moment yeah. to kind of look, he sees nothing. Uh, uh, he, he does say that. Uh, I don't think it's the the Baroness uh, as he gets up. Uh, I mean, I don't deal with them myself, but I don't think you can have more than one familiar at a time. And the, is, I mean, the Baron would have score? to be a, the Baron would have, like, does the Baron know magic at all? I mean, if, I don't think we've, we've seen that from him, so it probably isn't him. I've, uh, Varendel pipes up, I've never seen him use magic, but I haven't spent a lot of time around him. Mm. Similar with the Baroness. For most of the time I've known them both, the Baroness has been quite ill. And the Baron has been uh, not quite himself. The Baron and I were talking earlier when uh, somebody, well, there was some kind of emergency and everybody got taken into a room. And Sorry. Actually, was it like player trying to remember when I was talking to the Baron and I asked like, hey, who did the healing? And he kind of like implied that there was some kind of bargain made and that, that it cost a lot. When was that again? When was the discussion? Yeah. Like, was it when we were all in the room because of the emergency, or was it before that? It was before that. So the Baron okay. had drawn certain people into that library, and you were talking. The library, incidentally, where one of the packages was found. Okay. Uh, and he was talking about, he was trying to get to know everybody in the room, trying to get a sense of, of their feelings about the town, the, the attacks, their 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 future plans. And uh, yeah, I think you were the one that asked the question, or somebody asked the question about, about that. And he did kind of, he did answer a little bit, but did kind of, uh, suggest it was a private matter, but he did say that there it was a it was beyond a simple disease and then could not be cured by any way that he had found, but he had found someone to help and that it was a costly yeah. bargain. All right, yeah. So I'll mention that to Verindel. Well, that complicates. I'm wondering things. if yeah, I'm wondering. Uh, I've only ever heard about this, but what if he made a deal with a hag? Well, that complicates things. It's still his matter to deal with, I think, but um, I have no authority over the Baron. I work for him and the Baroness. Still, um, if one or Somebody's the other summoning aware, demons here, and that's not good. <laughs> well, there's still the diamond. I'm not exactly sure what the deal is with that. Frankly, I'm surprised we haven't seen anything of them so far. And with that, there's sort of a, a crack of thunder outside as the storm that's been flowing in uh, steadily kind of uh, is in full effect now over this high cape. Rain beats against the window. Annie? Mm hmm You said you, you had looked into the Baroness's sitting room. Was there... I mean, was there anything in there to imply? I mean, anything? <laughs> I mean, I know it there was... didn't look like a sitting room. It looked like it had some sort of plant, some sort of like viscous plant all over the floor with like pillows in the middle and a chest, if I am remembering that correctly. Mm. And then that crow flew out of it. Yeah, Sable said the crow was a family pet. Uh, I mean, maybe it was a familiar. I, I don't know for sure, but I think we've got to check those rooms out. If we can get into hers, I mean, maybe there's something in there. If not, then we got to get into the Baron's office. I can't be a part of that, but I can be somewhere else maybe somewhere closer to the Baron and Baroness to see if they're reacting. That's a good idea. Yeah. That sounds like a, a, a plan. Um, I think before we go poking our nose somewhere else, let's take a few minutes and kind of regroup in the sense of nobody's seen us in a while. So maybe go do a couple of dances and then continue looking into stuff. 
just so that people don't go looking for us. Well, nobody's yeah, seen him. Sounds good. Varanel points at Silas. I don't think you officially made it into the party, did you? Silas now looks like one of the other servants. <laughs> That's going to get confusing. Uh, me, me, sir? I've worked here all my life. Uh-huh. Uh, still, I really let's... should have got him the, the actor uh, fee. <laughs> no, sir. I'm totally here all normal and stuff. Um, Verandel quirks an eyebrow. It's, well, all right. Just don't turn, make me into a liar. It's already a little sketchy with what it is. There's something going on here, and if they're involved in it, they're not going to let us look into it. No. And if they're not involved in it, they may need to be protected from it. Yeah. All right. I'll see if either one of them seems unusual, I guess. If this something was of theirs, then they would have noticed, I guess, based on what you were saying. And um, I'll keep circulating, and I will be nowhere near the Baron's office or the Baroness's sitting room. Unless I have to be. Sounds like a plan. And with that, he kind of uh, pushes by you and uh, purposely strides out of the hallway <laughs> and kind of towards the, the ballroom, leaving the three of you there. So... What do you want to do? Should we all go out together? Or both of us? I should catch up with my Laura, actually. We, we, I've probably been here. She's wondering where I am, most likely. Yeah, if you guys want to make your presences known, um, I'm just going to... I'm going to like maybe find a spot to... Uh, quietly cast detect magic so that when we go in i can see if there's anything magical okay okay i'll let you know when i'm done and then maybe we can gather all right um yeah so i i think for now i would maybe go with verandel uh do one dance and then go continue basically participate in the party and then go off and continue okay and where's medrick going in the meantime going to congregate back to the uh, other part of the group so uh with that dudek sable and melora okay um and they were all aware of the things that were happening, right? Uh, they were aware of the, the packages, yes. Um, remind me, if you will, mm -hmm. if either, if any of you have talked to Dudek or Melora about Sable. No. I don't I recall. So. Not I about her. Okay. Um, like, we would have mentioned, it's like, yeah, that's the Baron Meredith's daughter. Okay. But... Or she would have introduced herself, basically, because she's almost an adult, right? Yep, yep, all right. She's a late teen. <laughs> but she certainly acts more adult than uh, she is, potentially. Um, and uh, Silas, you were staying behind to cast that Detect Magic, or are you going to just uh, find some other um, place to be? Actually, he'll go over to where we left Dudek, back at the other room. Okay. Um, yeah, because okay. Dudek was guarding the door to the uh, the tainted room. Right. And he's having a conversation with Sable and Melora at the moment. It's a, okay. As uh, uh, both, both uh, Silas and Medrick approach, you can hear this conversation going on. And you both know who, who Sable is and some of her other elements. Uh, and you also know Melora and Dudek. And it's three people who don't know anything about each other but we all know something about something else which is going on. So imagine this awkward conversation where all three of them are trying to find something to talk about, something normal to talk about, 
<laughs> and yet it kind of keeps shifting and the what one of one of each of them will redirect the conversation away from a topic and each for different reasons so that's what you're kind of walking into as you walk towards them um Silas is going to grab a tray of drinks on the way over. Uh, if there's someone who's uh, serving them, he'll uh, he'll say uh, he'll tell them to go take a break and uh, carry it around. Okay, I don't have the 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 cloud of servants who are operating around here, but you can imagine that there are servants kind of constantly moving through, and they are delivering food. A lot of the food gets left in the, the dining room. It's kind of a buffet style. Uh, but there are occasional people that go around with trays as much to pick up empty glasses as they are to deliver uh, additional ones because there's a variety of things to be to be had. Um, but none of them seem to pay, pay you much attention. Um, they're kind of used to tuning out each other as, they are, as much as they are uh, being tuned out by others. Um, I will have you make a performance check just to make sure. Uh, but I'll give you advantage because you have that that costume. Yeah, well, anyone? Yeah, no problem. You're fitting in perfectly. Um, and there is a bit of milling about for people. There are little miniature conversations that are that are happening. Uh, Melora kind of notices you uh, coming by, Medric, and kind of reaches out and grabs your hand. And there's this sort of look of. Oh, thank the heavens. <laughs> this was getting awkward. This was getting tough and kind of that look between you, but but not much uh, other than that. Um, Sable kind of looks at you and kind of looks around as if he's she's expecting someone else uh, and then is side-eyeing the servant, but not necessarily recognizing. It's more of, it could be him or it might not be him. I don't know. How do I know? And there's a little bit of look at, of, of sort of momentary panic. Um, Alice will give her a nod. And if she doesn't get it from that, he'll give her a wink. Uh, let's see how good she is at that, actually. I'm very kind of curious. Where is she at? Uh, uh, there we go. Sable. What is it, her insight? Oh, her insight's not good. Uh, yeah, she's still not quite certain. <laughs> um, but she's, she's at the moment not, not concerned about it. Uh, and Dudek kind of uh, uh, looks you up and down and, and just sort of... Um, that's that's not necessary. Thank you very much. And he is kind of standing in front of the door. He's trying to look casual as he's sort of guarding the door, but it also doesn't <laughs> look like the door is that, that terribly popular to anyone. Yeah. So I was going to say, <laughs> it's me. Uh, 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 can I get you any drinks? It's me. I just need cover to cast a detect magic spell. Okay. Is it still uh, smelly in there? Um. D Dudek is looking at Sable kind of uncertainly because he doesn't know how she's wrapped up in all of this. Um, yeah, I'm afraid there was some spillage in there. I, I, are you here to clean it up? He looks at, at uh, Silas, kind of trying to offer you an, an opening. Um, sure. Let me just take a peek in the door. If I fall unconscious, you know what happened. <laughs> And Silas, was was crack, dissipated Silas, by Silas would just crack the door open to see if if it's still persisting in there. Um, and you crack the door open, and there does not appear to be any any further residue. Uh, maybe it persisted because it was energized by the explosion, or or you're not sure. Um, but it doesn't seem to be vividly in the room, at least. There is a small sp smell. Um, maybe because the room itself has been sealed up for a while, and there's sort of an acrid smell of of uh, of decay almost uh but you're not you can't really localize it from the door okay silas will go in and close the door after him and then he'll just basically meditate for the 10 minutes they needs to do the spell okay uh, meanwhile as verandel and annie take to the main ballroom and the, the performers have have kind of tuned up again and they're starting once again their their uh their pieces um Annie, it takes you a moment as the as they are kind of gathering to to do the dance, uh, as they're being sort of instructed and suggested by um, let's see, um, uh, 
Yeah, it's probably uh, Akinrata, in fact, who's kind of overseeing things. Um, there's a lot less people here than there were before. Uh, he's kind of looking around. The Baron is over on the, the, the far side of the room, kind of looking at people. He's currently being uh, being talked at by that dwarf who's wearing that squid head outfit. Uh, and she's speaking quite uh, quite vociferously and kind of, um, you you have to do something about it. It's 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 going to be a much bigger problem. And the Baron's kind of like, I appreciate your concerns, but uh, the mountain is a bit outside of my jurisdiction and without concrete. So he's kind of kind of trying to keep her at bay. On his shoulder is the crow that you had seen before. And it does look every once in a while like the crow kind of leans in towards his ear uh, as if whispering. And he kind of absently nods a little bit as he's speaking to them. But Aknarada comes into the room uh, with a, a sort of uh, grand gesture, kind of claps, and the music starts up again. Uh, and he kind of starts to direct the dance. But you can see that the Baroness is not there. That's very immediately direct, uh, directly visible. But she could be anywhere in the building, for that matter. It's her home. Um, but a number of other people also seem to be, uh, be to be not there. It'll take you a moment to kind of tally it up. But there are other people kind of milling about as well who aren't part of this. You do know that the uh, the white swan and the gull were out talking in the hallway before and had seen towards the door the peacock and the eagle. Um... Actually, you do see Maximus kind of coming in. Uh, Maximus kind of comes through well, through the main area, I guess. Um, speaks quietly to Aknarada and then backs out into the hallway. Do we know who Aknarada is? Uh, yep, yeah, Aknarada is the Chamberlain. So okay, he's kind of perfect. the business director. He's the one that enforces taxes as well as kind of is the uh, deliverer yes. of all the, the good and bad news from the Baron. So he's, oh, that the, guy. he's, the, he's the government the, has representative, he found Midric essentially. Yet? Um, has he found Midric yet? No, but he's probably <laughs> had, a, had a, a, a few people looking around for it. Um, but he's the he's a sort of uh, a bit of a pompous, aloof uh, character. I believe he's wearing this, uh, yeah, black squirrel mask, um, which has this sort of weird weave of fur which is actually woven into his own hair uh, maybe to cover some of the the graying spots um, but he's very much taking control of the of the ballroom at this moment and kind of directing people and starting the the formal dancing but again not nearly as many people there as there were before the ram and the griffin both come in to join with the dancing you can see the uh, wooden duck the panther the uh strange... now when you say not as many like are we talking like half a quarter ish missing um let's see about the number here make a let's call it uh let's call it an insight check actually mm, okay I'll let you choose, insight or investigation. Investigation will take longer, be more accurate. Insight is, I'm looking around the room going, who's not here? Um, um, I'm going to go in, insight just because I don't want to be like digging around. I just want to basically, how, how much emptier is the room is basically what I'm trying to do. Um, not great. Uh, 11. Okay. It's a, it's a handful of people. Uh, in particular, you look around, and again, there could be some other people that are just in other parts of the building. But definitely, um, Ardwin Cartwright is not here. And Ardwin actually was enjoying the dance before. Uh, uh, you see that while the wooden duck is there, which is Nichetto Ohms, which is the, the, the carpenter, um, the uh, wooden goose, his daughter, is not there. Um, and you don't see Oliver Montrose either. 
and you know that he would not pass up the chance to strut around. There's a few others you're not really sure of, but those are, are definitely uh, among the missing, if you will. Okay. Um, I'm going to uh, join in on the dance and see what, like, basically the coming and goings for a song. Okay. And that was a, sorry, was that an investigation role or an uh, insight check? That was insight that okay. I did, yes. Okay. So that's just kind of the immediate one. And maybe you'll notice more as people are, are moving about um, as well. Um, and Akinrata will also join in. Wish is there and actually joins in. Uh, was a little less, a little more reluctant, maybe the first major dancing that was going on, but he does seem to be enjoying himself a little bit. Uh, like he's letting him, letting himself uh, relax a little bit more. That could also be that they've been serving alcohol all night. And he has been talking to the woman in seashells um, for a while. Liquid courage. Could be. Uh, the Baron does not jump join in the dance, but in fact stands back um, kind of observing everything. As the dance goes on, and we'll come back to you, we're going to go to Medric in a moment, but as the dance goes on, once more, you kind of notice every once in a while there's a sour note or a mistimed note, which does kind of throw the dance off a little bit. You get a good head of steam, a good rhythm, and then suddenly there's a note which is just a half second or half beat too, too short or too slow. Another one which is a little too fast, uh, injecting this sort of almost chaos as people are trying to keep up with it. Um, and Akinrata goes over to the band and you can hear some some loud words as the band. You're all dressed in these uh, sort of half blue, half white masks, kind of like the servants. Uh, or sorry, I think they have, I'm going to check now. I think they're, they're uh, anyway, they all have the same kind of mask in the band. Yeah, I think uh, they have half blue, half green, something like that. Uh, I think that's right, yeah. Um, and there are some heated words and some some muttered apologies um, from the uh, the band members. Um, it doesn't seem to improve their playing all that much, <laughs> but it does seem to be something which at least Akinrata is trying to straighten out. Meanwhile, while Silas is concentrating on his spell and they're concentrating on the dance and trying to imagine how, or trying to, trying to catch the other people there, um, what is Medric up to? I'll, uh, I'll just explain what happened in the dining room to everybody, basically. Okay. And uh, I'll are let you, Dudek know because are you, are you kind of including because it's Dudek, Melora, and Sable, and you know that there are secrets among the three of them. How are you approaching that? Are you just not caring at all and telling everybody everything, or are you trying to be subtle, or are you trying to draw some of them away from the others? Wasn't Melora there like when uh because Melora got hit pretty badly with the uh, exploding. Melora underside of the table bag, right? Actually, fell unconscious briefly. Yeah, uh, and so she knows Dudek something there, is going but didn't, on. didn't get harmed by it. You hadn't seen Sable before this point, uh, other than just in passing. And you know that with Sable, she somehow allied with the diamond. Yeah, which those two don't know, which would which would probably more for Melora than Dudek, who's really just a visiting uh, foreigner. Uh, but for Molora, that would be significant news, especially with her father, Ardwin. Um, but it, you don't know whether Sable knows anything about those things either, because she was not here when they were exploding and nobody has mentioned yeah. it to them. As I said, when you, when you kind of walked up, they were having this awkward conversation about trying to avoid anything whatsoever. Um, but I'm saying uh, hush hush about the diamond part, because yeah, do not need Melora and later on Edwin knowing uh, that. Sable was there when we blew up the pack, the uh, pouch. Oh, she uh, was? She, yeah, she was affected as well. She, her and okay. Melora both have exhaustion right now. Uh, okay. That's how Silas caught it, was he was trying to get Great. Sable out. Okay, okay. so she, she is aware of that part then. I'd forgotten that. Thank you. All right, so uh, there is more disappearing slimy things. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll enter the hallway as... Melora can enter the hallway too. Just so we're not like talking about these things out in the open and potentially being heard by anybody else. Okay. Um, 
So make a perception check at disadvantage. Uh oh. So I'm gonna move. But I am decent at perception, so this might be okay. It's gonna be sort of other things happening. Again, I'm not moving everybody constantly, but every once in a while I'll shift people just to show that. Um, oh, that nat twenty would have been nice, but it's a it's a fourteen. It's a fourteen. Okay. Um, you notice Dudek kind of turn his head as if he's sort of seeing or smelling something, but you don't notice anything. And after a moment, he kind of uh, shrugs and turns back to the conversation. Um, Did you see something? Uh, I'll ask Dudek. No, I don't think so. There were, or there might still be invisible creepy crawlies doing their creepy crawling. In fact, we uh, killed one in the kitchen or dining room. Make an and I'll describe check. how. Okay. Insight I'm good at. Not natural 20. Okay. When you described you've killed one, there's a brief uh, look of despair that crosses Sable's face. And it's very, very brief, but she's unable to control that reaction. I'm just writing that down. Yep, that's fair. I stood up and my knee forgot how to do its job. So no. that's fun. Ouch. Hopefully you're okay. That's why I struggled. I like got up to, to go use the washroom right quick. And that's why I like struggled to leave was that my knee was not bending. <laughs> oh, keep, keep care. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, we shouldn't have. But I'll pretend I didn't notice that, even though I totally didn't notice that. Uh, okay, then make a uh, uh, make a huh. try to hide your emotions. We'll call it a deception check, unless you're going to try to play it off as something different, which would be performance. But I think you're really just trying to hide your your own reaction. Twelve. Okay. Um. Yep, okay. She doesn't seem to notice, or you don't seem to notice that she notices if she did. Not to confuse things too much. Mm -hmm. um, did she notice, though? <laughs> who knows? Okay. Uh, but I'll let uh, Dudek know like that it, how it transformed into something, and it's probably something demonic, and it was a closet. And do you know anything more about these? Um, Dudek will kind of, kind of uh, stroke his beard and then kind of nod. You think it was a quasit, huh? Hmm. Well, that's interesting. And I'll have him roll his uh, arcana with advantage, because this is the kind of thing that he just knows. Uh, sorry, he'll make a history check, because he does not know arcana. He knows history. Let's kind of see. Nice. All right. Do that as an excellent historian. I've never dealt with them directly myself, but I have read a number of encounters with them. Nasty little creatures. Uh, they are servants, not much more, but they can be given some instructions to do things and are pretty adept at getting around. Um, you must have yeah, it, caught this one off guard if you managed just to corner it. It was invisible, and uh, then any... What does a and, quasit look like? Says uh, Sable. They might not all look the same, but this one was a centipede. And when it got attacked, and we, we thought it got killed, it turned into this creature. It was humanoid with an animal face. Fairly ugly. And it was no larger than gnome-sized. Yes, I, I think that's their natural form. I think they have the ability to shift... And can be anywhere. There are some interesting tales about how they were spies for different nobles at times, or for magic wielders, or for anyone else who could summon up such support. And the way it disappeared, it, it was uh, reminiscent of the table bags. Mm. So, so maybe I don't know was... if this thing is going around and placing them everywhere, or if there's even any more of them. That would make sense. 
They are small and quick and can be invisible. If the thing you have any were... methods of seeing them by any chance? Um, what does he have? <laughs> I didn't want to mention that Annie killed it because I mean I don't want disabled mad at Annie. <laughs> Well, I, I do know spells that can reveal invisibility, but they are somewhat limited. Um, and I hadn't really thought to use anything like that at the moment, but if you think there are more of those things, I can certainly give it a try. I have no reasons to believe that there are more, but it's a possibility. Sable looks uncomfortable. Um... Actually, you can make another insight check in this particular case. Yeah, too, I, I think I will. <laughs> for the uh, for the ride that she's been on. 24. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, it's been an emotional ride. So when you first mentioned killing the thing, uh, she reacted with uh, sort of sadness or surprise or concern. As you describe the thing... Um, there seemed to be a tension that left her shoulders uh, as if this was not the thing that she expected you had found. Um, but now at the mention of magically um, looking around, she seems a little bit agitated again. Maybe leave that sort of thing until we're more likely to be concerned with it. How likely Is that are Sable talking? Have... Uh, Sable, yeah. How okay. likely are we to find more than one of these things? Well, if it truly was some sort of magical uh, servant, while it is possible to summon more than one, they aren't usually all that reliable unless they're bound to you. And you can usually only bind one at a time. So it's not it's likely to be another people. one then? Well, not of that kind, no. Maybe multiple people summon some. Um, Silas, while you're in there making your chant, make a perception check at disadvantage, please. Eight. Okay. Um. I, mean, I can I can manage the spell, but it will take me a moment. What do you think, Medric? And he is kind of looking to you for for guidance. Um, we'll wait until Silas casts a spell, but just make sure it might be needed later. Because I'm assuming uh, Detect Magic will spot invisible stuff, right? No. Nope. Otherwise, it'd be a way to defeat that way too easily. Um, you know, how long would it take to cast it? Oh, it doesn't take long. A few seconds, really. Yeah, we should probably save that for later, then. Or at least after we can reconvene with Silas and Annie. And Sable kind of suddenly speaks up. I've got to go check on something. Um, let me know if there's anything I can do with this, or if you find another one of those things. I'm not so certain that my parents would have quite the right reaction to it but um, I definitely want to know your reaction to uh, the invisible familiars let's just say that this house well I haven't seen it but there are rumors that there are hidden things and possibly some un uncalm spirits Make a make an insight check. Twenty nine, not twenty. <laughs> Jeez, these are going up and up. This is amazing. Hey, you. Uh, I will. I probably, have I probably her just... roll because I think I don't know if it's actually within her range to be better than that. Uh, probably not. Um, oh, there she is. I don't know if it's within her range to be that good. It is not. Um, she seems to have convinced uh, uh, the others with this sort of casual thing. And there are stories 
about just about every old building <laughs> as well. Um, but she's totally lying right now. It's just that a made up excuse in the moment that there are other things that might be haunting around here and that they might be confused as to what they are. Um, but she's backing away, uh, having made her, her excuses and, uh, is kind of walking towards the other side of the building and has disappeared and disappears into the hallway across the other side. Mm -hmm. She knows more than what she's letting on, but that'll be an, an issue for later. I'm wondering how she's doing here, says Melora. How, in what sense? Well, all this stuff going on, that can't be good in your own home. No. I have reasons to believe she's involved with at least some of it, but... What? From past dealings I've had with her, me and my friends, she's not a bad person. So I legitimately don't think she's the enemy. And Melora kind of watches after her, uh, watches her go. Well, what does that mean? I don't, I don't know. know yet. Meanwhile, in the dancing, you've had a little more time to kind of look around the room. Uh, at least a half a dozen people are missing. Maybe a few more. It's hard to keep track of. And there might be a few that are other rooms, but it looks like at least a half a dozen people. Um... Again, you figured out a little bit more about who's not there. Uh, let's see. Um, another surprising one missing is the peacock, Caden Cook. Uh, he is a, a, the innkeeper's uh, master there. Uh, and he's been everywhere. For him to miss this part of the party seems unusual. Um and you also notice that the brown quesa, the horse-headed uh, uh, visitor, is uh, missing. Although, again, they could be just in another part of the building, but the fact that they haven't come through at all seems kind of odd. There's okay. a few other people that you can't account for, but again, you're not really sure. You wouldn't have expected, for example, Odega to join in on the dancing this time. Um Um, the uh, Verandel will actually break off from the dancing. It's still continuing on. And he just kind of leans in and whispers, I'm going to talk to the Baron. I'll see if there's anything I can learn from him. Let me know. And he makes his way over to, to stand before the Baron. And you can see immediately that there is, while there was... Um, Always a bit of, of uh, sort of respect given. He's, he's very formal about it, um, where he, he walks up, he stands straight at attention, he bows to the Baron. Very much the, this is my Lord, I will respect him kind of response. And approaching him from a very formal perspective. You can't hear what they're saying because the dancing continues on and the music continues its its pace a little bit louder perhaps than before it might be compensating for the the heavy rain that's beating against the far windows and the occasional rumble of thunder a little bit of brightness from the the uh the storm which is seemingly just out to sea the view throughout the big windows at the end of the ballroom is actually out over the end of the cape and you can see the 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 sea every once in a while uh it's sort of turbulent waves uh, rushing off towards the uh, horizon and this storm you know that ledge across. well <laughs> yeah yeah so um allegedly anyway <laughs> uh, we'll say that your spell goes off um silas so using detect magic yeah uh he'll let uh, uh, Annie and uh, Medrick uh, know that the uh, that he's cast the spell, so he's going to head over and wait for them. All right. All right. I'll mention. Good to know. Keep an eye out for Arduin the wooden goose 
all over the peacock and the brown horse. Uh, I've not seen them in a while, and they they seem to have disappeared. If my first thought was right, and they're sacrifices, we need to find them soon. Yep. Um, yeah, uh, when Silas gets over, is Sable still standing here? Oh, sorry, I was wondering where you went to, because you were in the library when you cast that, right? Yep. Yeah, he just walked out and uh, uh, then headed over towards the room. Well, well when you cast the spell. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, you, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> first of all, you do notice that there is a little residue around the room. Um, it's the, the residue of, let's see, probably um, sort of purplish green color. Um, there's a faint smell that you start to get, which is sort of a, uh, an acrid wintergreen, uh, which is the sign of conjuration magic. Mm, makes um, sense. As well as um, your tongue starts to go numb a little bit. Um, and there's a sort of underlying um, uh, sort of deep brown in points, which is uh, transmutation magic. So okay. both of those things are, are, are partially there. Uh, the door inward uh, looks kind of uh, green, but sort of a, a green um, that you would get from uh, uh, a early leaf, a very healthy looking green. Um, and that is abjuration magic or protection magic. Yeah, not unexpected. Um, and what is your passive perception? 17. Okay. Um, there is a weird blackish glow from beneath the table where you had seen that that bag, where the center point of it had been. Okay, he'll stop to check that out a little closer then. He won't touch it, though. He just wants to see if there's this rune they mentioned or something like that. Okay, and as you kind of move a little closer and dip your head down, you do indeed see the magical remnants of a rune now embedded onto the surface of the table underneath. It was not visible and in the normal spectrum, but because you're using detect magic, you're pulling out the literally the the magical essence of it. And it is almost swirling in color, um, featuring two or three different schools of magic: um, divination, conjuration, uh, illusion, and necromancy. All makes sense. Do I recognize the symbol? Um, I don't think it'd be in part of your core languages, but I can allow you to make an arcana check. Uh, yeah, I have draconic and abyssal. Oh, but, uh, then you do recognize it. Arcana. Okay, and I got a 19, so. Excellent. Uh, let me just put together have that listed in my notes um it is a an abyssal symbol but what's weird about it it is not a so a whole a solid symbol but in fact looks to be part of a larger uh, sentence um so it's only a fragment as if you kind of took an entire sentence wrote it out and then cut it up into small pieces um you don't have the sense of what it means directly um You'd need to see more than one together to probably re to put it back together in the nature of abyssal language. Uh, and it also has this weird thing where it seems to shift and move a little bit, but you're probably, you're fairly certain that that's a property of it being abyssal in, be in the beginning, uh, that, yeah. it, that it's hard for the, for a living mind to truly comprehend, uh, and has a little bit of an effect on the mind when you truly experience it. And that means also that this is true abyssal. This is not a, a uh, humanoid's rendering of abyssal. This is true abyssal. Hmm. And uh, the pamphlet that we had found up there with uh, up in the library with the the big spell in it was also an abyssal, was it not? Yes, but that was not okay. true abyssal because it did not move. Yeah, uh, that was a humanoid's rendering of it. Well, yeah, it did mess with my head, but uh, yeah. 
Um, okay. Uh, in that case, uh, when he he heads out, he'll also mention uh, uh, when he messages them. He'll mention that that whatever is doing this, that the symbol he saw left behind here was abyssal, which definitely suggest other dimensional entities, but uh, it's not a language, as, at least in his experience, it's not one that's known for demons or devils to use. It's more for outer entities. If that was a, a demonic familiar, I mean, Maybe an outer entity could use a demonic familiar. I don't know. There's something it's, strange going on. Yeah, it's something otherworldly that we know for sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, he'll head over. Uh, Did you investigate uh, where the other symbols were, or where, where the other like table bags were? Uh, no, uh, I don't know if we have time to check that out. If there's people missing, uh, I think this one was just because I blew it up. It burned it into the table. Um, I don't know if it would still be there at the other spots. Wait, people are missing? Uh, yeah, Annie. Uh, oh. Yeah. Uh, it's not a group Annie. chat. <laughs> yeah, okay. well, it's sort of a group chat. I think he can group chat out. But yeah, you guys can't talk to each other. Gotcha. Uh, we'll have to fix that at some point. Um, all of you need to carry uh, one of these little black books with you I'm, I assure you it's nothing bad <laughs> totally um, yeah so uh, he'll mention that uh, Annie's noticed that at least half a dozen people seem to be missing uh, so if if they are I'm, a, I'm worried that perhaps they're being used in some way right or possibly sacrificed um Hopefully they've all, I don't know, gone to the washroom. We can probably check. <laughs> I think there's only two of those. And I don't know if they're communal. Uh, the symbol that Ocean exposed in the washroom, that might still be there. It might give us a clue uh, as to what's going on anyway. Sure. I mean... Well, how about we check out her sitting room and then on the way back to his office, we can check out the toilet. All right. So to get out there, you will pass right by uh, Dudek and uh, Medrick. Um, mm -hmm. Both look at you expectantly, especially Dudek, who hasn't had this conversation, kind of looks at you yeah. with this quizzical look. Uh, I tell Dudek that I think the room is mostly safe, but there does seem to be some residue in there, so... I don't know if it's absolutely safe. Uh, and I tell him that whatever is leaving those those pouches, I think it's something abyssal. Um, and I, th I think people are going missing. Uh, he looks at Dudek and, and Melora and suggests that if they're not coming with us, that they stick together. Because if people are going missing, this could be something bad, like very bad. Yeah, uh, we could. Well, so we're just checking out the sitting room right now, right? That's Silas's plan. All um, right. And he does let, uh, yeah, and he, he would let Annie know that he was heading over. Uh, if she wants to come down, she can. If she's doing something else, that's fine, too. And I'll let Silas know that uh, Dudek has the means to detect invisible creatures. So that's something to keep in mind for later. And yeah, that, that's definitely a good plan for Dudek and Melora to be sticking around together. Yeah. yeah. With most concentrating spells, there are some visible effects. And when, um, when Silas steps out, despite having this illusion of someone else uh, active, it is noticeable that around his eyes, there's a bit of a blue glow. It's sort of fighting with mm -hmm. the illusion as well. But if anybody Probably looked closely, kinda... they'd see it pretty closely. Yeah, well, I think actually uh, for him, it's more that there's kind of a watery look in front of his eyes. Okay. Uh, like a bit of a shimmer, uh, but they wouldn't notice until they get, uh, until they're close to him. But, uh, but yeah, there'd be that sort of effect that he's seeing through. 
Typical servant just goes into the library to get high at a party. <laughs> <laughs> or take a few minutes off their feet. <laughs> yeah. yeah, man. Don't go in there anytime soon, man. It's rough. Dude, where's my familiar? <laughs> okay. So uh, I'll follow Silas. Dudek is going to stay here. Um, maybe I'll uh, make sure the room is uh, a bit more relaxed before I let anyone else in. No one seems to be coming over in this direction anyway, so it's not really a big deal. Yeah. And I'll stand here just to make sure I could use a little bit of, uh, of a breather. In fact, there's a small bench there, and Melora actually takes a seat down on the bench, still somewhat <laughs> haggard over her experience before. All right, and the two of you make your way over. Um, and, in fact, at this point, Sable is no longer standing there. But if you walk over, you can see that she's down at the end of the hallway, kind of facing towards the window. You can vaguely make out the sounds of speaking. I'll just listen. Actually, hey, Silas, Silas, what's she saying? Um, and I'll let Silas, Silas go ahead of me. <laughs> Silas, will try, Silas will peek around the corner and try to hear. All right. Uh, make a stealth check. I mean, the servant. Because, uh, yeah. Go ahead and make a stealth check. Oh, uh, stealth. Sorry. Wow. Uh, well, the stealth. perception is important as well, but that's a hilarious roll. Uh, the stealth is pretty good. Uh, let's see. She is actively keeping watch, but I don't think she's going to roll that well. She does not. She does not seem to notice you at the end of the hallway trying to pay attention. Yeah. I can't hear what she's saying. However, either. she's facing away from you and whispering, and all you're really aware of is that she's whispering. Could I hear her, like, from down into the side of the hallway? I mean, you can always stand beside her and try to figure out what's going on, but at the moment, it's hard to hear her. Yeah. She's deliberately making it hard to be heard. Um, so yeah. You do remember, however, that she did whisper into the small necklace mm -hmm. that she had been holding before. Oh, yeah. No, yeah, he, she's he, talking to the diamond. Yeah, he says he tells Medrick that she's probably just talking to the diamond. Actually, and so, so I, I had this. Uh, I had the uh, the, those are like obsidian amulets because I, I there was we 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 got into a fight with them before and I like kept two of them. Mm -hmm. So I'll just grab that and put it next to my ear. Just see what happens. Okay. I'm tempted to have you make a luck roll, but no. Mm. Um, it is a cold stone up against your ear. That's it. Okay. I think they're dead. Yeah. Um, it's, Silas is just gonna say just loud enough for her to hear. Uh, tell the diamond I said hi. Uh, we're going into the room now. <laughs> she does startle a little bit hearing the voice behind her, um, and then does a double take because I don't think the voice matched the face at that particular moment. Uh, no, not so much. And uh, and kind of looks a little bit cross and a little bit embarrassed and then turns away quickly to the window once more. Uh, and maybe the voice gets a, a little bit quieter as she's speaking. Um, so you stand before this door. Yeah. What do my inhuman eyes see? Uh, the door seems uh, normal, actually. So no magic left on it? Um... Hmm, I'm trying to remember what that was. I remember there was some sort of magic that Dudek was suppressing, I think, for Annie to pick the lock. Oh, actually, yes, that would have returned by now. Um, so, yes, the, there is a strong uh, flavor of, uh, let's see here, um, a strong green similar to what you saw in the previous door, actually. Abjuration magic. Mm. It is protected in one way or another. Um, can Silas figure out how to disarm it? I'm not sure how you do uh, disarming magical traps. But he's probably, got Arcana. You're probably aware that there are spells to do so. You can make an Arcana ro roll if you want. Twenty-two. Nice. Sable um, might be able to open it. 
the strength and sort of continuousness of the of the of the color of green that you're seeing across the door suggests that it's a more of a permanent enchantment than a momentary spell. And those can be gotten rid of by uh, dispelling magic, probably, but not necessarily permanently because it's inbuilt into the object itself. Um, alternatively, there are spells to just dispel any kind of lock, magical or otherwise, uh, but they are very noticeable. Aside from that, um, there's probably a key. It might be a key phrase. It might be an object. Uh, it might be uh, something that someone is wearing or something that someone is using. Silas is going to write in his book and ask Annie how she opened the lock. <laughs> He'll ask Annie and Dudek uh, how they got the lock open because the magic's back. Dudek cast a thing and I used the good tools to, to open it. Yeah, I cast a spell to, to temporarily lower the magical field around it. But it truly was Annie's skill that was able to open the door. It seemed like a complicated lock even for that. It was quite hard, and Sable said that even she couldn't open it. Hmm. Well... Should we ask Sable? She's right there. I mean, she said she couldn't open it, but she might have an idea of what the, of what the key it looks like or where it is. Silas, Silas pops down and says, um, sorry to interrupt the conversation. Uh, do you have a key to this room? Um, <laughs> she kind of turns, actually, she straightens up as if sort of like, I'm not going to react right away. And then kind of turns hands down Kind of turns around to you. Uh, no, servant. I do not have a, a key for a private chamber in the building. I'm sorry. Perhaps you can take it up with the head butler? Hmm. And there's sort of a, a, a play at a servant just asked me a question. I will give the appropriate uh, public response. <laughs> But it's also kind of awkward because she also can't open the door. But uh. does she know it's Silas? Though? <laughs> well, she saw this particular servant. I'm assuming using the same one that she would recognize. Yeah, he'll switch it. Uh, he'll just switch it around occasionally. To in this case, yeah, he'll use one of the ones he had used earlier. Yeah. Um, she's pretty sure too that if if an actual servant said Sable, they would be in trouble. I don't know. She seemed pretty familiar with a servant earlier. Oh. Um, Not in public, however. <laughs> well. Uh, Silas will ask Dudek uh, if he could do that thing again, because uh, we don't have any way to get through the door otherwise. I'll and let's right. say we get in and run into trouble. How do we get out? Uh, presumably the door. I mean, they're usually guarded from the outside, but not so much from the inside. Here's hoping. Mm. All right. I realize I hadn't chosen all of his spells. Uh, okay. Um. I mean, I could try to command the door open, but I don't think it'd work. Uh, Melora will be staying behind, kind of guarding that door, the role that Dudek had before, as he strides purposely across the room. Um, there's a, a break in the music, Annie, and you see uh, Maximus step forward into the room, um, catch Aknarada's eye, seeming to whisper something to his ear. And then Aknarada kind of moves out of the room with Maximus now taking the lead on the dancing. Um, Dudek kind of looks in the hallway. You can see that there's, you know, the the gull at one end of the, of the hallway just sauntering in, not really paying much attention, kind of walking down the hallway. Um, 
let's see. Uh, you see the woman in yellow lace kind of enter the main section. And you notice also, uh, Annie, that the woman in yellow lace has left the ballroom. She was part of the, the whole thing before. And kind of leaves now to go in. And you guys kind of notice that she goes into the toilets. Privacy. Um, and Dudek is, is a little bit concerned in watching the, the person with the gull and trying to keep time with the different servants that are still floating around. Mm -hmm. um, but trying to look for an opportunity to cast the spell. Are you going to assist him in any way to... Yeah, uh, Silas will keep him covered. Okay. I'll also keep him covered. All right. And he leans up against the door and begins to cast his spell in a slightly whispered voice, but he's trying to put force into it. And let's see how well he does this time. Nice. Nice. Um, with your magical sight, you can see that the green kind of shrinks down and kind of diminishes. It's still there, but it's a thin green um, enchantment, not active anymore. And the door seems to be unprotected at the moment. I can stand over here just to make sure no one's going to interrupt us. That would sure. Be um, so Silas will... Let's see. Okay, he left the tools with Annie. So uh, he's going to tr just try the door first. Okay. Uh, it is locked. It was, unlocked. It. it was unlocked before, but it is locked now. Uh, Those fancy automatic relocking mechanisms. Mm. Can you tell Sable that if the magical lock is down, maybe she can figure out the physical lock? Uh, yeah. We'll let Sable know that the door is locked again, so we may need her down here. Uh, let's see. Does he have anything that would help? Uh, he grabs, uh, let's see, a pen uh, and a small knife, and he will attempt to pick the lock with those. <laughs> okay. Um, roll me a sleight of hand with disadvantage. Okay. Is also going to have the uh, the rabbit's foot. Okay. Though he has not used it yet. Uh, I go sleight of hand. Wow. Nineteen wow. with disadvantage. That's a really good roll. Uh, it's not enough, but it's a really good roll. Uh, as okay. you kind of jam the, the the little knife in, you can hear it kind of. It's like almost turning, and then something else goes clunk, and then it kind of. The knife stuck into the lock now. Takes a little then bit of effort he to will, remove. Uh, well, then he will rabbit's foot that. Using up one of its charges to re-roll with advantage. Nice. And re-roll ones. Oh, my God. Might not work, but... Oh, 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 there you oh, go. Oh. 25, natural 20. <laughs> As you're kind of rubbing the, the, the foot and the, the knife's still kind of stuck in the in the lock, you start to wiggle it around, and then you hear this sort of screeching noise as whatever's inside is trying to reconfigure, but then you just sort of, uh, you you get that, that, that muscle cramp in your leg that you, wasn't, you weren't expecting to have happen, and it kind of pitches you forward ever, ever so slightly, and the knife kind of kinks in almost up to the hilt, uh, and then the, the little pen slides in the other side, and you hear as the door unlocks. He'll write it quick. Uh, never mind, Danny. Got it. <laughs> uh, okay, careful of the floor. Uh, yeah. As a response, you get you. Annie. Um, in the ballroom. Yeah. As mm -hmm. the, the 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 dance kind of quiets down, and people are sitting off to the side and relaxing a little bit, and you hear him talking in your in your in your head. Um. Around the room, the way it is lit, 
is with several uh, permanent flame sconces. And the sconces have this, this uh, uh, metallic covering that can be turned to block the light. They can't be turned off, but they can be blocked. And simultaneously, all around the ballroom, every single one of them, one after another, thunk, 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 close off. The room goes dark. There's a bit of, a, of an excited scream from uh, seashells and a bit of an, of, a, of an annoyed sound from a number, number of the others. Something's happening in here. If, if Silas just... Uh, <laughs> careful of the floor. Something's happening in here. The lights all just went out. Purposefully. You hear the loud caw of the raven at the far end where the the Baron is standing up near the glass and there's flashes of lightning that are illuminating the Baron and then suddenly you see that there is not one but two people standing there illuminated partially. Standing in front of the Baron now is an eight foot tall figure with massive uh, large horns on its head. It looks vaguely humanoid but larger in size and scope than anyone. It's towering over the uh, the Baron and uh, there's another scream as uh, uh, Squid moves back uh, away from the scene. The band also seems to sort of shrink a little bit. Uh, Verendel uh, reaches forward to strike this uh, this creature that seems to be menacing the Baron, and his hand goes right through it. Maximus backs away a little bit, and the rumble of thunder continues. Do you take any action at the moment? I would like to, I would be like in the middle of dancing. I'm going to move towards the closest wall that I know of. Well, it's hard to move because... towards the walls you don't know of, but uh... yeah. <laughs> so probably where Wish is standing, probably standing beside him. Yeah, I'm going to kind of fumble my way to there so that I have the wall beside me. And uh, Seashells is kind of slinking in towards uh, Wish. And in fact, probably has uh, uh, um, unintentionally or perhaps intentionally kind of launched onto Wish and is kind of grabbing on in, in fright uh, as you hear uh, her uh, speak. What thing is this? No one understand. Why here? What this? And the voice sounds remarkably familiar. Uh, in fact, you recognize that voice. Uh, where is her name? Stela? It is Stela. Um, How did she get an invite? But still, like... Um, let's see. Where is her name? Oh, her name is question mark. That's right. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't put her name in this list. Um, where are you, seashells? Um, and you remember that she actually came with Oliver. Right, right. Um, but yes, Stela, who you have not seen for quite some time, actually, but apparently is still kicking around town and still facing unknowns and not happy about some of those. <laughs> um, that's the... That's the one you rescued a long, long yeah. time ago. Yeah, the sea elf. From deep underwater. Perfect. Um... Meanwhile, back out towards the door. The door is unlocked. You've you've seen no change in the light and where you are. There was the crashing of thunder before, but and still continues to be fairly frequent. You can continue with what you're doing if you want. I'll look at. I'll just give Sable a brief look, and I'll whisper down the hall. Hopefully, it reaches her. The door's open. Um, Silas steps in. Okay. Um, Does she follow? Uh, Sable is definitely curious about this. Um, you notice that she seems torn. She's definitely drawn to this, but she seems distracted by something. Um, you step into the room, and the first thing you notice is when you step in towards the beginning, there's no light in this particular space at the moment, um, but your your magical sense is still kicking in for a few more minutes anyway. Um, oh, he's got dark vision too. 
True. You still have detect magic going though, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for a little yep, while. Yeah, for ten minutes. And the, I got dark vision too. So. The entirety of the floor uh, gives off. Where are we here? Let's see. Um, a sort of black and gray aura, um, suggesting. Uh, sorry, black and black and brown, suggesting um, uh, amounts of necromancy and amounts of transmutation. Uh, when you step in, it, it feels at first like a thick carpet, but then you notice it swirling and moving around your feet. Uh, please make a strength saving throw. There we go. Seven. Okay. Uh, you are grappled. I'm assuming it's not magic. It's just them grabbing me. Uh, it's... Hmm. If it's magic, it's 13, which is not all that much better. Yeah, regardless, it still succeeds. Um, and it's, it's always one of those things about, is it magic or is it magical? Because those aren't quite the same thing. Um, in any case, the vines grow up around your legs and kind of cover your entire body and drag you deeper into the room. Um, Medric, you're standing right there and you see uh, uh, Silas take a step in and then be engulfed by these sort of green vines that move him off to the side. More green I'll vines start, start moving towards the door and are closing it. I'll step in. Okay. Uh, Sable, strength, if you come in here, watch out. Strength saving throw at disadvantage, because it's also using the door. <laughs> As literally vines are grabbing around the door and trying to close it. 12? Wait, at disadvantage. At yeah, disadvantage, 12. but 12 to begin with is pretty bad. Uh, as you are, as the door closes, essentially shoving you back out into the hallway. Fuck. I'll open it again. It's locked. Sable, do you have lockpicks? Step out of the way. I'll step out of the way. And she will proceed to go at that. In the meantime, um, you feel this thing kind of uh, reaching around you and holding you, but also kind of gently poking at you. And you realize that it is, it is piercing the illusion and getting the true sense of who you are underneath the illusion. Um, as though it's, it's kind of perceives the illusion, but isn't fooled by it. It's not squeezing you, but you feel mm. your skin, wherever it comes in contact, tingle slightly, but there's no effect. Um, he said, well, aren't you interesting? Uh, does he see any other magic in the room, like the chests, the pillows? Uh... Make a perception check at disadvantage, because your vision is mostly obscured by these vines, which have engulfed you. But it's still possible you can see around it. Mm. Yeah, unfortunately... Seven. It's it, you. You get glimpses, but you can't make out what the glimpses are attached to. There is other magic in the room, um, of a number of different colors, but a, a momentary glimpse and then a, a vine kind of crosses across your face, and you kind of struggle around it, and it still isn't quite uh, able to be seen. Uh, stable will step up and start to try to unlock this. Um, let's see. She has really good lock picks. Unfortunately, Sable is struggling with this at the moment. I've never I'll tell her what lock. Silas did and what Annie did earlier. Maybe you'd like to give her advantage. Okay. Um, it's going to take her a bit of time. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's a matter of she can't re she's she she kind of grumbles and she does say like I've tried this door so many times never been able to open it. And you can hear the frustration there as well. I'll give her guidance. You got this. And I, I saw Annie, like, she, she had, like, the big lockpick this way and the other one kind of like that. And I don't know if that helps. Not really, but thanks. Um, and you can see when she's pulled out kind of from nowhere. You don't know exactly where she pulled this out of. But she has a little, a little uh, leather roll in which she's pulling out these very exquisite looking tools. Like 
this is no amateur kit. This is this is a very expensive looking kit. Um, so in the meantime, Annie. Hello. <laughs> you, uh, mute? Um... <laughs> you get the sense that there is words being uttered that you cannot hear the swirling of wind. And you can even make out that the figure uh, standing in front of the Baron is holding out one shadowy hand with a finger extended. And the Baron is not looking, uh, af well, actually, I got to roll for him. Uh, he's not looking afraid initially. Let's see how long that lasts. Uh, where are you here, buddy? Uh, I don't have the Baron's sheet open. Why did I not do that? That's silly. Um, but there are words being exchanged. Most people are backing up out of the room. The servants have all backed out. Um, even Maximus is kind of back towards the door. Um, the band seems... Actually, make an insight check to get the feel of the room to be proper. Uh, meanwhile... Uh, if the lights are still out, I can't see. Uh, okay. I'm the one so that you're, only, you're only really seeing uh, the Baron and the Shadow and a little bit of uh, Verandel. Um, kind of with the, the lightning crashing outside. Yep. Basically, I can feel if there's someone within 10 feet of me and that's and where they are, and that's about it. Okay. Um, I'm going to, if Wish is still beside me, I'm going to whisper to him to get out. Um, and I'm going to try to um, follow the wall, basically is my goal okay um wish will effectively carry stela with him as he moves through the door um maximus is also kind of backing into the hallway as well when i get to the door is there any light in the hallway still there is light in the hallway it does not seem to pierce through the door of the ballroom. But there is light Weird. in the hallway. Okay. I am going to stay here for a moment and see what happens. Okay. And from this angle, you can see more clearly the sort of gestures being made by um, the shadowy figure. Um, go ahead and make a perception check at disadvantage to try to overhear. Unless you've got something else that would help you with hearing. Uh, well, that's a good roll for disadvantage. Um, <laughs> as far as hearing, I don't think I have anything. I don't think so. I think you have mm. you have the goggles potentially to give you dark vision, but I don't think you have anything particular for hearing. But mm. I want to throw it just in case. No, I don't. Uh... Okay. What was the mm. roll with disadvantage? Uh, with disadvantage, it was an 18 out of 15, so that would be a 16 low. Okay. You're catching words every once in a while, but not full sentences, so I'll try to mimic that. Uh, let's see here. I don't think I wrote up the full speech. Um... I make sure I have my notes in front of me for that part. Uh, right. So um, the voice is unfamiliar. The voice sounds... Uh, actually, sorry, the voice is familiar. Uh, the tone of the voice, the sound of the voice, uh, it is familiar because you have heard the shadow speak more than once. It is that same sort of hollow, deep voice that sounds almost like it's coming from somewhere else entirely. It sounds angry and accusing and threatening. And again, Verendel is trying to, to, uh, uh, to approach the, the, the shadow of any kind. And he picks up a chair, goes right through him. Um, and then the Baron kind of holds out his hand as if to wait. Uh, the Baron is seemingly, um, uh, unaffected for the moment and in fact kind of uh, sits with arms crossed um, and you can make out the shadow or the the, uh, the the backlit form of the of the little crow sitting on his shoulder 
kind of speaking as well into his ear or chittering into his ear. Um, oh, I had the full thing here, but I'm going to have to do it from memory. But um, you hear words like abandoned and fraud and um, will expose you for the the thief that you are. Death did not stop vengeance. Um, actually, where is that line here? Um, and you can kind of see in the stance of the uh, of the Baron that he's he's growing increasingly impatient. The howling of the wind grows stronger. You can feel or you can hear hail now hitting the windows, uh, making massive sounds. Um, you can't see, so that won't work for that. Um, hmm, yeah, you'll have to roll again. Okay. Uh, as you see the Baron, wow, okay, do very well on his roll. Again, same roll, 18 each time. Uh, but this time you see him shake his head uh, as if uh, shaking off some sort of effect. And then almost begins a primal growl. You will regret, and he's very, very loud and, and uh, expressive. You will regret crossing me. I don't know where you've gotten your tail. I don't know how you've come to know the things that you've known. But I can assure you, you are dead to me. And I will put an end to your haunting. And with that, he reaches into the inside of his jacket and pulls out a long saber far longer than would have fit inside of his jacket uh, it's got a long curved blade that glows slightly blue white even in this dark area pocket of holding nice um, and then when he kind of presents it outward uh, and kind of grips the the uh, the handle of the blade it shines to a bright, uh, bright light, kind of like a, a, a full-on torch, but glowing kind of blue. And you can feel, even as far away as you are, you can feel the temperature drop steadily. A little bit of fog forms in the air as the warmth of this party, uh, it meets the utter cold uh, 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 emanating from this weapon. And the creature takes a step back. The Baron swings, seeing an opening. This should be interesting. Ooh. While this is happening, I'm going to step behind Barondel and, and whisper behind you. Okay. He is rather transfixed on what's happening in front of him. Uh, that seems yep. like a, an appropriate opening role as uh, with this fear, uh, this terrible blade, the Baron swings and it's a crit. Um, I don't know if I can click on that for damage. Yeah. Okay. There we go. So pretty good opening hit of 18 points. As you see the, the, the weapon strike out and, clear through the shadow which does not seem affected but it was very clearly a solid and direct hit meanwhile sable's taking another deep breath and she's got you've, guidance now you've, you've given her a, a, an, an appropriate level of opportunity a little bit of extra magical guidance i'll have to add the guidance on in a moment you got this Hey, uh, 26 and a 
Wow, I forgot how to roll them. Uh, here we go. So 28 total. And maybe, I mean, obviously, there was a little bit of, of, of a flare of fire when you cast Guidance. The little nimbus of, of uh, fire rolling over her and over her actions. Maybe you're the only one who noticed it, uh, Medric. Maybe she didn't seem to notice it, but it seemed to spur her even further. And very quickly, she lets out a little cry of joy. I did it. I opened it. All right. I now watch it. out. There's going to be vines. There's going to be vines that are going to grab you as soon as you step in there. And probably me too. So that's going to be an adventure. <laughs> so um, she swings the door open. And is about to take a step in. I'll hold the door, make sure it doesn't close again. Okay. This one, now I'm ready for the vines to try to close it. Okay. Nothing seems to happen. Then she steps in. And immediately the vines gather around her feet and try to pull her away. And I'll step in too afterwards. Um, I will say that because she had... Uh, no, yes, she was right there when it happened to... To uh, uh, oh, just a second. I got to check out her skills because there's a thing for this. Um, uh, Wait a sec. Uh, oh, that's only for damage. <laughs> so yes, she will attempt to to get out of the way. Um, unfortunately, it is a strong uh, thing, and. Oh, yeah, that's actually enough. It's 16. Uh, so she manages to kind of step aside and from them and, and move deeper in. All right. Damn it, why did I close this? Uh, however, the vines still make it very complicated to move across the floor. Uh, I'll cast freedom of movement on myself. Oh, good idea. And step in before the door closes. All right. I just got to be careful of how long this lasts. I think it's like an hour. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's it's one of those ones that, yeah, is... is... It's quite a while. It's wonderful. It Best is. spell in the game. <laughs> so, yeah, it's one of the better ones in D&D &D online, too. <laughs> yep. yep. So I'm in. All right. Um, yeah, and so the vines swim up around you, but little, little bursts of flame, like an aura around you, kind of kind of uh, fire off and every time it tries to get closer they kind of burn off a little bit um okay. and unless you're holding the door it doesn't oh, let it close you. okay and you can hear uh dudek down the hallway wait should you clunk, clunk the door closes and you can't hear anything from outside this room is not lit but i believe you have dark vision um you can I'll see... cast uh produce flame uh okay little little ball it's of flame cantrip. appears in your hand um which is good just because uh, I don't know if Sable has dark vision, but now she can see around too. She didn't seem to be bothered by the lack of light, um, but you both see uh, around the room the the the, the, the grass-like substance on the floor is sort of swimming and moving in every, in every direction. It will make it difficult to move for most people, not for Medric in this particular case. Uh, and you look around and you do not see Silas until you look over in the corner and see a Silas-shaped bundle of vines and leaves which is basically holding him in the corner. Silas, you've been held there. You can try to oh. escape on your own, but you do hear the door open again. I'll try to uh, clear the vines from that are wrapped around Silas, so that'll give him advantage, I guess. Silas is more... Since these things don't seem to be doing anything other than holding him here, he's going to try and take a look around again. Okay. And then when they open the door, he's just going to like try to wave his staff a little like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> So you're taking another look around to see if you can see any magical yeah, things? just to see what he can see, yeah. Okay. Nope. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's it's kind of like, you can't see me. They're just the vines floating in front of your face so frequently. Um, so the, the bundle of vines is moving and, and seems to be slightly lumpier on one side rather than another, which is basically you moving the, the staff. Um, I'll try to clear the vines from Silas as you hopefully tries to escape them. Okay, and Sable is going to try to move over as well to help. Uh, you see them attack her again as she tries to move through. 
Uh, and once again, she's trying to re uh, rescue herself <laughs> and manages to. She is not strong, but she's rolling well uh, as she kind of manages to sort of, with sheer determination, move through this room. However, you do notice that her dress is taking the toll. Uh, I'll, I'll notice that. Badly, uh, badly rest. Sable, hold still. I'll cast freedom of movement, of movement on her, too. Oh, okay. That works, too. I just hope there's no boss fight at the end because I'm getting pretty low on spell slots. <laughs> <laughs> um, as once again, these things kind of uh, co uh, collide around the two of you, but no particular harm. Uh, now you can make an attempt to escape. Um, there are a couple of different ways to do this. You can attack the vines. You could try to pull the vines aside. You can try to just help uh, Silas free himself. You do yeah. have uh, uh, Sable there as well, so you can also figure out what role she might play in this. Actually, just find any patch of exposed, like, exposed Silas. <laughs> and I'll get ready to cast a spell. <laughs> there really isn't much exposed Silas. You literally have to fight your way through the vines to get to touch him. Okay. Yeah. Um, they, can't, they can't restrict you, but they can block you. All right. So that's an attack, essentially. Make a, an unarmed attack roll. Can it be an unarmed uh, spell, uh, like, touch spell casting roll? Hmm. Or actually, yeah, I'll just make an attack roll. It's kind of an attack roll to get your hand through. <laughs> it's not. That, it's not that he's moving. <laughs> Holy crap! Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, you, my bad rolls. You, you come happening. up against a, a a solid wall of plant, and are unable to get a hold of him. Um, you can even feel like different layers of the plants are kind of growing under your hand. Uh, and so, while it can't move you away, it's basically built up a layer of plant between you and him at this moment. Silas is going to try and break free. Okay. The plant is distracted by my hand. Sable, uh, you can have Sable try to help you if you want. Sure. Okay, that gives you advantage. 12. <laughs> Unfortunately, neither one of you is able to actually uh, uh, shift the massive vines that are around you, holding you up for a little while longer. Um, you can feel them constricting against you. Uh, make another strength saving throw. Actually, sorry, constitution saving throw. 18. Okay. Nice. Um, you manage to resist as they are trying to essentially squeeze the breath out of you and knock you unconscious, but you're managed to kind of just angle yourself the right way. Get that get that staff in the right way to, to prevent it from squish, squishing your lungs. Um, you also still feel that little that little touch every time it comes in contact with you. Oh, actually, uh, uh, I gotta roll it here. Do to do. There we go. Um, Medric, you take six points of poison damage as you push your hand through unsuccessfully into that. Yeah. As you feel this sort of sickly substance um, rubbing off on your hands and. Sable I'll tell also. Sable, watch out, it's poisonous. Well, and as she was helping him to try to remove the, the, okay. the vines, um, she kind of pulls her hands back as well. It's like, what is this stuff? Um, I can leave you guys for a couple of minutes to think if you've got another idea, or you can jump right into it. I can just, I just have to get a hand on, to, on Silas, and yeah. then it's... Silas is just going to be... keep trying to break free, and yeah. Okay. Um, do you communicate that to uh, Silas in any way that you're just trying to get a hand on him? Yeah. Okay. So I'll make it free to move. Trying to reach out, assuming that he can just pull him out. Yeah. So we'll say that you can get advantage on this on this uh, unarmed attack. Yeah. Right now. Sure. All right. There's a twenty-three hey. and a nine. Let's take the twenty-three. All right. Uh, you do take two points of poison damage, but you have a hold of Silas. And I'll cast Freedom of Movement on Silas. There you go. That does not immediately get you free, but it does make it a lot easier. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think it's just a movement at that point. I think I need an action to get free. Uh, five feet of movement, and you automatically escape. Yeah. Uh, well, he'll use five feet of movement. <laughs> yep. And you easily step out of it and... You can feel it kind of trying to hold on, but um, again, little 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 bursts of flame as it's, as it's trying to grab onto you as the magic is taking hold. 
we have roughly an hour before this wears off, so we have to find out whatever we're looking for and get out of here before that happens. Because otherwise, yeah. I'm pretty sure we're going to die here. <laughs> Those things are way too friendly. Also, I think they're poisonous. They uh, are. You guys might want to watch out. That explains uh, it. Now that, he, now that he's free, what does he see around the room? Okay. Finally stepping out of the curtain of, of plants, um, you see a couple of different things which are magical. Um, over in the far... Uh, upper uh, upper right yeah. corner there is a chest it is magical of some kind um, you're not sure what the chest itself is about uh, a four feet wide about uh, three feet tall it looks like an ornate wooden chest but it doesn't stand out too much differently from the other two chests in the room um, they are not magical in nature um, the windows uh, are uh, showing off a level of where are we here uh, oops. Um, of a, a bluish uh, cast, uh, which tells you it is probably illusion magic on the windows. Um, in the center of the room, almost obscured, however, by the pillows and by the mass of writhing vines and, uh, and uh, 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 writhing vines and plants, that's what I say, um, you do make out a uh, what looks like a circle of some kind on the floor itself. It is very obscured, but you're picking out a little bit of magic around the edges. Uh, and that magic seems to be... Uh, yeah, it is, it, is a, it is a vaguely purple color, indicating it's probably conjuration magic of some kind. I think that's the right one. Okay. <clears throat> Um, okay. Uh, first thing, yeah. I'll let you guys think about that for a moment. I will address your question, Marie. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if it's me misremembering or just. So there has been two instances that I recall where you've heard the sound of the voice of the shadow. Um, mm -hmm. One of them, yes, that temple was one of the places you had heard um, some of the others speak in different voices, I believe it was the way I described it. Um, you encountered the diamond uh, in the sunken temple, yeah. or in the mm -hmm. sinking temple, and his voice was distorted, and it sounds like that. So it's, to you, it's as familiar as the, as the diamond, but it has that otherworldly quality of the shadow. And you're kind of realizing the two, two voices sound very much the same. Okay. Because I remembered also um, having a shadowy figure mm -hmm. with diamond eyes in a dream yes. that was offering me aid. But there's a dream, and also at Kathwan's temple, there was a black shadow with diamond glowing eyes that talked to you yeah. and yeah. recognized you. Yeah. Yeah. It represented itself as the diamond in both those cases, but this does not have that same appearance, and yet the voice is the same. So it would be, yeah. it would be an easy presumption to suggest that this is the shadow behind the diamond or one and the same kind of have to figure that out on your own okay um, um okay so there's a magic circle on the ground and there's the chest is magical and, and the, windows. the windows had delusion yeah are the vines magical that, um uh, the the vines do give off a magical um it would be purple as well. It's a different kind. It's it's conjuration, um, as though they are coming from somewhere else. Um. So, uh, did I know what kind of magic was on the chest? It was uh, abjuration, I think. Um, I think you said it was blue. Uh, blue is illusion. But on the chest, it would be in, it would be orange. It's a, it's an enchantment of some kind. Okay. Um, Silas will check the circle and see if see if there's any inkling of like if there's um, draconic or aberrant.
it uh, or anything like that that might suggest a link to something like whether it has the same kind of aberrant symbols that we saw in the or that he saw in the table um okay um it's hard to see much of the symbols because they are very much obscured by the the uh, the massive vines themselves, which are still like even though it's not really able to affect you, this room is still very much alive. This room is still yeah. very much trying to to capture you, uh, as though it has a particular duty and it's steadfast trying to do that. So. Um, you're only going to be able to catch very small glimpses unless you do something yeah. to try to remove them away from the circle. It's because that it's magical you're even able to see the the effect of it there kind of yeah. sparsely through the thing. Um, um. The shadow levels its finger at the Baron once more. Um, and this time seems to be a different tactic. Um, it seems to be trying to goad the sha or goad the Baron who already seems to be, you know, you can kind of make out in the flashes of light and the reflections of light, you can see almost a, a, a madness forming in the Baron himself. His eyes are wide and bright. His uh, teeth are set. There's a, a, a lopsided, terrible grin on his face. And he's, he's weighing the, the options of the, the sword. Uh, Verendel at one point, uh, just kind of tries to catch his attention, uh, asking, you know, uh, Baron what, and that's about all he gets out before the Baron turns at him and swings. So now we get to see what happens when the Baron hits Verendel. Wait, the Baron's hitting Verendel? Uh, and that's an easy strike, because uh, Verendel is, actually, what is Verendel? Because he doesn't go anywhere without some protection, so to speak. Oh, that still hits. Uh, as the the uh, the the scimitar cuts across uh, Verendel's uh, chest, and you can see the sort of icy after effect of the uh, shoot right here uh, of the blade itself. It's almost as though when it cuts through the air, it freezes the air behind it ever so slightly. Um, and he staggers backwards um, under the wound. But the Baron does not seem to notice what he had hit. He seems to be in full defensive mode and getting angrier. And the, the shadow levels its hand once more. See? You are nothing more than a madman. You admit it with your actions. You are the one I've been looking for. And with that, there's a gesture. And in the room, especially you, Annie, because of the ability you have to sense things, you sense something sidling up a little bit closer, which then turns into a distinct shaped shadow and then a second and then a third as low down to the ground long and lithe like a large cat three more shadows appear and start to stalk forward they look to be semi-solid panthers of some kind and the that baron lets out a laugh at last I will face something worthy. And the voice seems very thick, unrefined, primal. Back in the other room. Well, if Silas can't get a clear view of it, that's fine. Uh, he'll go over and check out the uh, uh Not chest. without taking some sort of action to try to move those out of the way or scare them back? Or... Yeah. No, uh, we're short on time. Uh, just leave that for now. If there's anything useful, it's probably in the chest. Uh... Oh, 
Just can I cast a? Yeah, I'll wait until Silas' turn is over. Uh, yeah, like just Silas doesn't really have any way of dealing with magic like this, so he's just going to try and open the chest. Okay, it is. Whatever long. happens, happens. Okay. Sable's at the other side of the room. Uh, Sable has this weird, wide-eyed look on her face because as she's moving through, like, this magic is defending her against constant attack. And she's kind of marveling at the whole effect of it all, that she's not actually being, you know, pummeled by this stuff. There may also be something of the, I've been wanting to get in here for a long time, and now I'm in here, and I don't really know what to do because I was not expecting to be in here kind of thing. Yeah. Trying to take it all in. It is an utterly I just bizarre... wanted to get in here. It's a whole achievement mm. was just to get in. Um, it also is um, very, uh, a very strange sight. This room is utterly weird. And you all get a sense of, of kind of this weird sense of energy, I guess you might say, where it, it feels as though the room is somehow wrong not just from the, the the gathering of vines and things that seem to be defending it, but also just from a, a sense of otherworldly power. Um, well, uh, Silas is... I assume that was a, just a, a standard interact action to try to open it. Uh, yep. Is it like an external padlock or is it a built-in lock? I take a closer look, and it looks like a relatively plain padlock. Thick, okay. but plain. Then he's going to charge up the staff and try to smash the... Uh, Silas, wait. Uh, Sable can probably do it. I think he was already Silas in motion already before. Swung. Yeah, he doesn't really yeah. wait for anybody, uh, <laughs> for the most part. All right, you can certainly make an attack. And that's your shillelaying up the thing. Yep. yep. That's definitely an attack. That's yeah. definitely a hit. That's an 18. Uh, uh, no booming later. So just the four magical bludgeoning damage. Okay. You, you definitely made a dent in the, in the lock. Okay. Well, that's his action. Okay. It is a little bit loud, but there also seems to be no sound from outside of this room. As though the mm. room itself is quite well padded. Uh, and those pillars are still in the center, incongruously enough, kind of they're they're shifting every once in a while as the vines around them kind of kind of move. Um I'll cast Sable, the sacred flame at the middle of the pillows to clear vines from the symbol. Okay. Um sacred flame they can't dodge. Well, actually, I guess technically they can dodge. Uh <laughs> It's just, uh, they're not really, um, let's see, they're mostly stuck in place. Yeah, a four is not like going to No matter go. where I hit, I, I hit. <laughs> yeah. Well, they, they kind of, they sense the, the welling of energy and try to kind of move back, but you notice that most of them are rooted at one point or another in the floor. So, um, so what's the damage on that? Uh, 2d8, I'm, there's no extra damage based on level, is there? No, no not for that just one. 2d8. Okay. All right. Let there be light. Well, oh, big numbers. Nice. Yeah, you, you, you kind of, there's this burst of, of uh, divine energy, a little sort of uh, blowing out of, it looks like fire, but it's actually radiant damage. Uh, and it does clear away a, a, a significant section of the center of those, of those vines. The pillows go flying off into the sides, not so much from the impact of the sacred flame, but from all the flinching of all the individual vines who are trying to get away from it, they kind of toss the pillows across the room. It's like, that can't be comfortable. Like, who would put pillows there? Uh, Silas, do you see the symbol? It is more visible if you want to take a closer look. Or you can continue to pound away at the lock. That's up to you. Um, sure, he'll take a closer look. For now, he can always lock pound later. Okay. What languages do you know? Draconic and Abyssal. And common. Okay. This happens to oddly work out. Uh, as you examine the symbols that are all around the circle, um, it, it is odd because there's the sort of, the sort of pointed and, and straight lined, um, carvings that are 
uh, typical of draconic that are, are mostly dominating the circle, but intertwined with those, there is abyssal as though the two are, are combined in some way. Um, it will take you some time to decipher the whole thing, but at first glance, uh, make an arcana check. And because you know both languages, you can just make a straight up arcana check. There's no difficulty. Nice. Um, 16. 16. Yeah, if you had to guess, you'd say this is a teleportation circle. Ah. And if you had um, to guess, then these things are probably themselves partially transferred through it. Yeah. Ooh. Uh, while Silas is looking at that, he'll say, um, you guys might want to leave because it's poisonous, but if you don't, could you get the, the, the chest open? And then it goes back to, oh, wow. Okay. Uh, and it seems as though from the attack that's now been made on the floor, it seems more agitated. And in fact, now the vines are kind of kind of winding themselves together into larger uh, lumbering um, uh, tendrils and are starting to try to whack at each other, uh, right? at each of you, I should say. So there will be some defending attacks. Uh, they can't grapple you anymore, but now they know that there's something serious going on. Uh, attempting at Medric, first of all, because fire bad. 23 oh, probably hits. Oh, yeah, that hits. <laughs> um, um, so, 11 bludgeoning damage. Oh, jeez. Wait, ah, where's my one? Okay. And 7 poison damage. Uh, at Sable, it misses Sable. And at uh, Silas, I think a 13 misses Silas too. Yeah, that's a miss. So it's it's appropriate. They got angry at the fire guy for firing. Um, but now the room has turned hostile. Um, back to the others. And you see three shadow panthers appear out of nowhere. Your first instinct is that maybe they were summoned, but then you think back to, wait, I've been feeling invisible things moving around here. They were probably just invisible and able to move because of the shadowy thing. And they seem to be kind of advancing towards the Baron. Varendel is defending himself with a chair at the moment. As right now um i have a dagger and no armor varendel has no armor and no well, a chair um i <sighs> so this type of of dress in like this time period the pockets are like apart underneath the petticoat and the way I've been accessing my, my, my dagger is through that, that pocket. I'm going to put my hand in my pocket on my dagger, but I'm also going uh, so that I have it ready. Um, but I'm going to take the dodge action and wait for one more turn to see what happens. Okay. And as my Bonus action, I'm going to uh, tell Verandel we can't, this isn't our fight. We can't fight this. We need to go. Um, and in order to give him advantage to get out of a situation should he need to. Okay. Um. He looks torn. He is loyal to the Baron. He wants to know what's going wrong, and he does. He knows the Baron's being attacked. Um, so you see him pause. There, there's uh, no coming out of this. Basically, uh, you see him pause and um, kind of put his hand to his forehead, as if concentrating. 
and then kind of gestures in a way that you've never seen him do before. Uh, he gestures with his hand kind of moving outward in a graceful pattern. And then you kind of realize it's like a leaf caught on the, on the wind. He's a leaf on the wind. Go figure. Um, and around the Baron, you see a greenish glow, like a pile of leaves flowing over his body. And every once in a while, there's a sort of wisp of green energy that is, in fact, a leaf as he casts Shield of Faith over the Baron. Because he could not just simply leave. Um, the shadow um, simply steps back or really flows back. And this close to it, you can see that there's, there's no feet it is literally a hovering shadow uh, with these massive uh, horns on its head. Um, as these creatures start to advance towards the Baron. You can see a bit because of the lights. I will allow you to make a perception check as you're kind of watching and strategizing about all this. 14. 14? Okay, that's enough. The far panther on the other side walks right by the squid-headed uh, lady, looks briefly over at the band, and there's a weird moment where you think, is it going to attack the band? And then the panther nods, acknowledgement, and then turns towards the Baron. Oh, it's to the band or to the, or to the squid? Uh, to the band. Mm okay. <laughs> uh, meanwhile, in the room, the room is hostile, but you, you haven't been so badly battered by it so far. If you want to continue to pursue that, uh, either you can uh, call Sable over, who is kind of moving around these sorts of things. She was uncertain as to what to do. And now is kind of taking a defensive stance. You're muted, uh, Pat. Yeah. Um, you guys should get out. This is not safe for for most people. And he'll take another crack at the uh, thing. But this time he's going to uh, uh, he's going to sonic boom it. Okay. Still no hex, though. All right. Oh, cover your ears. <laughs> uh, 15 definitely oh. hits. Yeah, of course. One thunder damage. <laughs> oh, uh, my one God. thunder and six bludgeoning, so it's another seven. Um, however, that is enough. It is a tough lock, but not that tough. And with that sonic boom, you kind of uh, see it kind of crack in half, and then uh, it is now loosely hanging there. You've broken the lock. It's definitely broken, and noticeably so. Well, he's going to try and flip the top open then. Okay, yep, you kick the lock off the door, uh, off the, the edge of the, the, the uh, chest. I'm running out of words, so we're not too far from the end mm. for the day, I'm afraid. Uh, and the it flips open. You can see that there are, there are uh, uh, sort of... Uh, thick heavy tomes within they look very very old uh made out of very primitive looking paper and the, at least that's what you see on the top okay that's good it's not a mimic with a lip piercing <laughs> i was worried it might be uh that's it for silas's okay. turn medrick um, silas what does the symbol say uh, who's it? I think it's a teleport circle. I don't know where it goes, though. Are these things coming out of it? They might have drifted in with whoever traveled back and forth, but they're not directly coming out of it. All right. What is it doing here? Says Sable. I think your mother teleports to some other place. The runes are 
draconic and abyssal. I don't know what that means, but it means nothing good. Yeah. Uh, Rules question: uh, If I want to summon a flame blade, or not a flame blade, but a spiritual weapon, mm -hmm. can I cast uh, sacred flame before it, or? Uh, it just depends upon the. Uh... Yeah, it's one cantrip and one regular spell, and one's a bonus action. The other one's a regular. Right. Action. right it's yeah. it's a non cantrip spell that I can't. Do. Okay. That's right. Yeah. All right. So sacred yeah, flame, well. the center. Okay. Two D eight. Uh, again, it can almost move out of the way. It's not really good at it. Seven. Oh, that's less good numbers. Uh, let's see. Uh, 22. Oh, not 20. It manages to kind of shimmy out of the way. Well, it's going to shimmy into the way of the spiritual weapon, which also appears in the center. Okay. Uh, and that's only uh, my, my modifier, right? For attack? No, it's a spell attack roll. Okay. Do I actually have... What? What did we make your uh, spiritual weapon? I think I have it here. Somewhere. It was a hammer. Yes, and there's a flaming hammer somewhere. Wait, what's the number again? I just looked it up, and I just immediately forgot. Oh, there it is. <sighs> what is wrong with my mind? Uh, you if you have a wisdom of 14, your spell attack roll should be a six, I think. I mean, like the, uh, how many D8s is it? Oh, spiritual oh. weapon? Yeah, uh, I think it's one D8, or is it, does it go up to two D8? It does go up with spell slots, third or higher. Yeah, depends okay. on what spell slot you use to cast it. Uh, two, probably, so only one D8, okay. Plus, Plus my spell, spell modifier. Modifier, yep. You'd think I would remember that at some point. Yeah, it's been a little while. Ha, eight nice. damage. Uh, ten damage. Wait, no. I didn't make an attack roll. Oh, yes, you do that. Can we save that damage, though, if I do hit? All right. 24. Oh, yeah, that definitely hits. Hey. So it's kind of like rolling all the dice at the same time. <laughs> Except not at all. <laughs> uh, yep, no, it's it's uh, it's definitely. Um, so you got a flaming hammer, which is kind of mashing away at this pile of of vines and things. It's it it's one of those weird things where it doesn't really feel like you're making progress in a way. You know you're hitting it. Mm -hmm. You know you're in damage, but there isn't really the carcass of vines left behind. It's just kind of getting mushed into the whole pile of things, and then. Other vines kind of consume those vines. It's a little creepy. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, they're going to also uh, make another round of uh, of attempts here as well. Um, starting with Medric because he's mashing away at them. Uh, that's a. That was a hammer, not me. Uh, well, you did do the spiritual, uh, or did do the uh, <laughs> uh, uh, sacred flame. So, not that it necessarily knows that, but I'm going to say it knows that. Um, for, oof, that's a weird one. Max and min on damage, so 10 bludgeoning. I don't have a specific sheet for these guys, unfortunately. And five poison. As it's kind of bashing and battering away at you. It will again... How bad does it look? Um, I mean, how bad does a room full of vines look? It's pretty mashed up in the center, that's for certain. Uh, it misses Sable and misses uh, Silas. So <laughs> it's really just a battle between you and the finds at this point. The rest is kind of irrelevant. Because I got maybe like two rounds left. <laughs> um, so do you want to do anything? I'm going to go stick with you guys for the moment if you, if you guys want to take another round. I'll tell Sable, see if you can pick that lock. Of the chest she's standing next to. And Silas, you're, you're taking those books, right? Silas is opening up the bag of holding that Annie gave nice. him. Nice. Uh, <laughs> chucking books in. Okay. He can look at them later. Yeah. Actually, is there anything on the covers of them that would be draconic or abyssal or anything like that? The one on the top is definitely draconic. You do not see the signs of abyssal in the, in the writing on the cover. Uh, the... the um, 
would be said. I wasn't expecting that to translate them. I forgot that you had uh, Draconic. Um, I think the title of the top book, the one you pull out, is, is uh, just simply Legacy. Okie dokie. The rest, he just piles into the, uh, as many as he can into the bag of holding. So you pull out the book. It is remarkably heavy. Its cover is made of solid, solid stone. Uh, and the pages, while they have some primitiveness to them, are, are thick and heavy. Um, this book probably weighs 30 pounds. That's nothing. So okay. it is for, for a book anyway. And the yeah. other weird thing is, as you draw the book out of the out of the box, it's bigger than it was when it was in there. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you're pulling that book out and putting it in your pack. Medric, are you going to try to do anything? S Sable will try to unlock that, but she seems very distracted at the moment, which is definitely going to affect her ability to do anything. Uh, what's the uh, range of these uh, vine tentacles? It seems like they can reach across the room. Okay, well, I'm just going to, you know, Stand defensively, I guess. Wait, if I stand defensively, I can't attack. Or... Yeah. Silas is going to yell, you guys need to run. I'll grab as many of these as I can and follow you. Uh, yeah, with the the, the sort of battering and, and bruising, she's not able to open that particular lock at the moment. She does seem to be making progress, but it's sort of like trying to, to move out of the way to avoid the vine, and it kind of crashes across the top of the, of the box. The box kind of crackles a little bit uh, as though it was partially broken by that uh, but she hasn't unlocked it yet All right and Vera and Medrick was there anything else you wanted to do I was going to move to the corner but I mean if if it can hit me from anywhere it's I'm just going to stand put and I'll grab yeah. a pillow it actually looks... I'll grab a pillow and use it as a shield I know it looks ridiculous but if it hits the pillow then it's going to like all right it won't be the like... typical shield bonus but uh, maybe yeah. it will be we'll give it a small chance uh, meanwhile, but like it'll take the poison, right? So I won't take the poison. Uh, it will depend on whether you are able to defend with it. I'll, I'll, I'll we'll see if a roll makes makes sense there. Um, Varendel hasn't left yet, uh, but he has taken that action to protect the Baron. So, uh, what are you up to uh, at the moment, Annie? I'll let him know what I realized with the band. Okay. How do you phrase that? I'm kind of curious as to what you want to say to him. I don't even know. So, <laughs> so what? Just to confirm, what I saw was that the panther was not hostile, but it like basically like nodded to the band. It is as though it acknowledged the band as either an equal or it knew them, but it didn't was not hostile to them at all. Or there was disco, or there was those uh, discordant notes like summoned them here. Is the band still playing? No, no, no. When when everything started to go to hell, they started to kind of cringe in the corner. I mean, they, they should uh, be taking a closer them, look at them. You might be able to figure out more, but because it's so dark, it's hard to see much from here. Yeah. Um, I'm going to take a defensive stance, and he's a big boy. He can handle himself, uh, and I'm going to kind of stay against the wall and move this way. Okay, so moving a little further away. The more and more you move, the less and less you can make out of the Baron, or even Varendel for that matter, mm -hmm. uh, who is warily standing there. Uh, and in fact, will take the dodge action uh, because last time he tried to step away, the Baron attacked him. Uh, and in fact, the Baron does uh, take a swing in his direction, almost blindly. that is with this advantage and misses entirely smashing a chair with his hit okay um, are you doing anything yeah else? i'm going to continue with the dodge action uh with my hand on, on my dagger uh in case i need it okay and um yeah that's about it as you pass by the Shadow Panther, it seems to pay you no mind whatsoever. Okay. As they all start to advance on the Baron. The Shadow cries out, Admit it! 
Admit who you really are. Embrace who you really are. I know it, and you know it deep within you. Uh, and that will be a an attack. And that will be a four on the wisdom save. The Baron's manner changes. And there's sort of a deep welling of... Not exactly humor. It's the humor of madness, if anything. As in deep within. Uh, something is broken. A dam is broken, or a... As a... Uh, 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 a long-forgotten part of his personality wells up, and he grits his teeth and then laughs. You want to know who I really am, who I had to be to survive. And where is it? Oh, I hate when I can't find my notes. At dramatic moments. Um... Pardon me, I have to find this. It's too important. It's like me with my spells that I never remember. <laughs> you know what? I realized I had it in a different document and I can look for it there more fast more quickly. There we go. I am Baron Elias Harquin, but I wasn't always. No. People knew me. People feared my name. Few live to tell the tale. Under that name, under that banner, I did what I needed to. In the name of the king, in the name of the queen, in the name of all that fought. You knew me then, Shadow. You knew me as Rowan Spencer. Or perhaps the name... Is this a name that I know? Uh, make a history check. That make is... With... It... Oh, go make ahead. it with advantage. Especially for the next part, which we'll sink it in. Okay. Um... That is a... 23. 23? Nice. The name Rowan Spencer rings a bell. But it's not until he says the next part that it clues in entirely. I ruled the waves. I was the dread. I was the fear. If you don't recognize my name, whoever you are, Shadow, and you will know the legend of Captain Thornheart of the Bloody, and I will demonstrate why they called me that. Why they called me cold. That name rings a bell. And you also kind of figure out the name Rowan Spencer. Captain Thornhart the Bloody was a notorious pirate. And there are lots of tales told about Thornhart. He was ruthless. He took dozens of ships from everyone until suddenly he stopped. There's a couple of different stories about why he stopped. He was defeated by the Royal Navy. He was retired. He died at sea. Lots of stories. Then there was a Captain Spencer who was a privateer working for the Royal Alarian Navy. Now you've come to realize, if what his statement is said is true, that he was both of those people. Why he's now known as Elias Harquin, you're not sure. For what you knew, Baron Harquin is the rightful Baron of this land. but that floods to you. It oh, that's going to throw Berendel for a loop. 
It also kind of, well, it also, uh, with that public statement, he kind of rears up and you can see his shoulders tensing and you can actually hear the jacket he's wearing is starting to, to tear and rip as he's flexing his muscles. Uh, and there's a little bit of a foam speck around his mouth. Uh, as he swings this this long uh, rapier, or his long scimitar, rapier, yeah, scimitar, actually. Uh, I think I called it a cutlass before, which is probably more appropriate, actually. <laughs> um, without any uh, without any effort, as if it's an extension of his hand. Uh, as he moves it, you do see a trace of of cold throughout the air. And once again, the, the, the feeling of the air drops in temperature. And then the, the shadow, with some satisfaction, says, At last, the real you is revealed, and you will pay for my murder. There's a caw from the raven on, her sho on his shoulder. It sounds alarmed. It sounds surprised. It sounds concerned, but isn't looking at the Baron or the Shadow. But it's something beyond the two of them. This is me bringing information that I'm I'm not sure. Isn't there a rumor that Uzwin was part of an infinite an infamous pirate kept captain's band before he he started working for the king? There are plenty of rumors of what his life was like before the king, yes. Okay. Because I remember there being something about pirates and the king before he met the queen and Oswin and something like that. But it's been a while since we worked out backstories. Yeah, yeah. Um, Oswin has possibly a very checkered past, but being part of the Seven, he's, his past is forgotten and forgiven. In well, fair enough. For, in return for loyalty. Which mm -hmm. is not necessarily a pattern that doesn't get repeated. It may have been repeated here. Okay. The raven launches off the baron's shoulder. Circles around the room. Up over your head, actually, uh, uh, Annie. Kind of in that direction. Avoiding to be way out of, out of, out of reach of the panther. Although the panther is not entirely certain what to make of it, it does look up and watch, but doesn't seem to make any attempt to attack. As it crests, or as it moves through and kind of reaches the doorway, it passes through the doorway and the hallway goes dark. And the storm stops. All sound everywhere seems to freeze. And each of you feel this strange shift. In front of you, in the room, Medric mm -hmm. and Silas and Sable see the runes start to glow. But they grow, they glow almost from an inward sense. And Silas, as you glance over, you see that they're changing slightly. The abyssal runes are almost overtaking the draconic runes, as though it's rewriting itself. And there's a strange feeling in your stomach, like you're falling. And everything changes. Uh, you're muted. Yeah, Silas just says, oh dear. <laughs> There's a moment of, of, of swirl and darkness, edged with green and purple and a sort of bruise-like orangey blue. You find yourself moving involuntarily as everything around you shifts. You lose sight of one another. You lose sight of everything. And then everything once more is solid but dark with eerie green glows coming from different places. And the map shifts. 
you do not find yourself in the same place as you were. You find yourself in an entirely different space, nowhere near where you were standing. The ground is no longer wooden, but seems to be composed of mossy stone in many places, or wood overtaken by grass and green. You feel the air thick with a musk, the smell of stale, diseased plants. The sound seems to echo in strange ways around you, absorbed by the walls which themselves seem overthrown with vines and made of stone. But much of the furniture seems similar, although broken and overtaken. Uh, those of you with Arcana can make an Arcana roll. Okay. Uh, Thirteen. Hard to say exactly, but it feels a little like moving between realms, much like was in the the fantastical nightmare castle that you went through. I would also ask that uh, Medric and Annie both make wisdom saving throws uh -oh. as you feel the edge of your sanity pulling at you. For Silas, you don't feel anything wrong. Silas's sanity is kind of thinning anyway. But 17. you feel hollow. Same 17. Okay. Both of you resist the effects as the realm shifting does not seem to capture into your mind. You can feel the pressure, though. It's a weird pressure. It's almost as though it is trying to force you into primitive emotion. Silas, you notice that you not only feel hollow, you look hollow. You look insubstantial, in fact. Transparent almost as though you are no longer there. And the world is lost of color or smell and only vaguely of sound. Huh. Initial questions or impressions and then we'll tie up for tonight. I'll try to figure out where each of you are. <laughs> uh, do I still have my grip on the bag of holding? Is my spiritual weapon still here? The spiritual weapon is not here. The bag of holding is still in your hand. Wow. You managed to get that one book into it. The case in front of you is empty. Actually, it's not just empty. It looks as though it looks into an abyss. There is no bottom to the box. I'm going to close up the bag of holding and tie it back to my waist. Okay. And you find yourself at the end of a hallway. You can see substantial growth kind of blocking off the the uh, exit to the hallway. Okay. Um, so I was in the ballroom, but now I'm in a hallway. Is Varendale anywhere nearby? You don't see him. Okay. You are standing in front of a door, by the way. I'm not sure if you can see that from where you are. Okay. Um, uh, all we can yeah. see is a room with Sable and Jordy and uh, the ship room. So you can't see yourselves? I can see myself and everything's dark. <laughs> okay. oh, I don't. found me, so. Okay, I'm just moving you slightly because uh, I okay, activate sorry. the site. Yeah, things wider. Okay. Yeah. yeah, you should be able I to see yourself. Myself. Yeah. So I can Silas, see that I'm in a toilet. Silas, you find yourself it's which labeled as the solar. Um, you see yeah. in the same room, you see Dudek and Wish. And the sound is very muted. It's almost as though you can't really see them or they aren't really here. But Wish seems to be doubled over. At first you think in pain and then you kind of hear in that weird echoey way, like someone speaking through a fog bank, you hear him laughing, uproariously laughing, nonstop, can't stop, doubled over, continuously laughing. Dudek, on the other hand, you see him with 
arms kind of haunched, and you can see that his fingers are pointed at the end. And he seems to be approaching Wish, as though to strike him. Uh oh, they failed their saving throws. Mm. Uh oh, SpaghettiO. Yeah, Medrick, Medrick, you do indeed find yourself in the washroom. It looks as okay. though it has been abandoned for a hundred years, broken down. There's pools of water on the floor. Um, not much detail other than that. I am going to be very practical. Uh, and kind of try to fasten my skirt so it's not as in my way okay. to, to move. So I'm going to like bunch it up and fasten it so that it I have feet movement. Um, and I am going to take, um, basically try to evaluate uh, what's going on. So I'm going to hide, which is a 24 to hide. And I'm going to sneak. This is a bush. Seems to be. Okay, I'm going to sneak to to the bush to see what I can see from there. Okay. If I see any movement or anything. As you move down the hallway, you start to hear um, a strange sort of, of glugging sound. It seems repeated, but weirdly joyous. And you hear another one, which is sort of a low chuckle. Uh, it sounds as though two people are laughing not far away from you, just around the corner, really. From where you are as well, you can also make out something in the very center of the room ahead. So the end of the hallway, just around the corner. Actually, you can't wait to see it there because it's the end of the hallway there. But you kind of make out a, a sort of glowing green from not far away. Silas, you see that Dudek is about to strike Wish. Silas will try to get between them and stop uh, Dudek. Uh, he'll yell out as well. Okay. You move... And it is almost as though you don't move, but the world seems to move around you. And you stand between the two of them, facing Dudek, who swings down with his arm, and strikes Wish, his arm passing right through you. He doesn't seem to notice you or hear mm. you. It's what not a very, to Wish? It's not a very uh, a nasty hit. It's really only a scratch on the shoulder. Wish straightens up. And let's see here. Oh no, Wish is going to ruin his shit. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing happens. Or not. Otherwise, just a scratch on his shirt. He continues to laugh as if nothing happened. Silas is going to see if he has his book on him. Uh, his book? Yes, yep. his uh, book of shadows. Yep, it manifests as it normally does. He's going to uh, write to... Uh, Dudek, Annie, and uh, Medrick, are you here too? Things are strange. I appear to be a ghost. So I, when, I'm in the washroom. It looks like it's been abandoned for a hundred years. So Medrick gets the message? Yep. Okay. Just wanted to double check. And I get the message as well, do I? You do. I'm in some sort of hallway. And there's something glowing green. The response from Dudek hmm. is odd. 
it is primitive and it almost defies being written down. It is pure rage, pure anger, pure animal instinct. It's sort of this weird drawn out sound that appears across your page. He seems to uh, look up and look around for a second and then proceed to look towards Wish again as if to attack. I'm in the Solarium. Wish and Dudek are here, but they're out of their minds. Oh, and one further thing as you stand closer to them and see them. The light is weird. It's like you can see anything around about 10 feet in front of you, and everything vanishes beyond that point. It's not dark. It just vanishes. It's as though your perception is only limited to a small circle around you. Um, but as you kind of take in Wish, you realize that his entire head now is made of a gleaming metal with fashioned, over-exaggerated uh, eyebrows and a, a very strong, prominent st uh, a brow line. And the metal seems to streak down and actually flows underneath his clothing as well. Not solid everywhere, mm. but in a pattern that probably crosses across his back. Maybe tracing the tattoos that he has uh, across his back and across his arms. For... What was Dudek's mask? Oh, sorry. Yep. Uh, just getting to that now. Um, for uh, Dudek, um, his face is distorted and stretched out in front of him and you can now see there's sort of edge his eyes are larger than they were before and his nose is broader than it was before and silver seems to spread itself throughout his beard which was sort of gray and white before and some red but now it seems to be purely silver and glint slightly as you recall that dudek's mask was actually a fancy silver porpoise and Wish's mask was a, a massive metal uh, uh, defensive mask, really. I think that, I think we've been pulled into another plane, possibly an, ab or probably an aberrant one. Wish and, and Dudek seems to have become their masks. I felt something still... strange, but unless I've become an illusion. Hmm. And I think that's where we'll pause for the evening for you guys to contemplate that. If you want to look around the map that you can see, that's fine. Uh, you probably can't see that much of it at the moment because you haven't left the areas you're in. But what has happened? What strangeness is this? What fresh hell? Have I decided to throw in here? Well, it's hard to say. Really. <laughs> you know, I have I have thoughts and ideas. It's weird, I admit. But nonetheless, uh, if you have been watching, I want to thank you for watching um, this odd little campaign. Um, I didn't do anything normal, apparently. Um, but if you want to watch more of it, you can check it out on YouTube, youtubecom slash ncaf one You can find the uh, the LOTDI campaign to the Great Confusion. We're also going to be playing again in two more weeks, and then we'll be a bit of a break after that uh, right on Twitch on Sunday afternoons, 3 o'clock Atlantic time, approximately. Uh, I want to thank my players for uh, sticking it in for this, <laughs> whatever this is, uh, and the vast for running. Changing, uh, things. Uh, and we'll do it again in a couple of weeks. So, again. And happy day to, everybody, to all the moms out there. That's true. That's true. Uh, have a good... Have a good Mother's Day, and I gotta find my my cursor. All right, take care. <laughs>